Yeah, okay. So please. Good afternoon to all the dignitaries from IIST and Sarveshetra Academy. Good afternoon, students. Welcome to IIST School Programs 2020 Beyond the Horizon. We have come to the last day of a five-day series, which was organized by Indian Institute of Space Science and Technology in association with Sarvashetra Cultural, Academic and Charitable Center managed by CMI Fathers. Today, we begin with the first speaker of the day is Dr. Jinesh KB who is an associate professor in the Department of Physics, IIST. And the topic so today we'll be dealing with the art of becoming a physicist. I'm sure students, you are eager to know about SIRS Biodata. Dr. Jinish Sir has done, has achieved his first PhD degree in physics from Leiden University in Netherlands, and the next one in electrical engineering from 20 University of Technology, Netherlands. He has worked as a scientist at Delft University of Technology and then moved to Philips Research in Netherlands to work on CMOS technology developments. Later, he has joined as a scientist in IMEC, Netherlands, and worked in the field of ultra-low power sensors. In 2010, he joined Nanyang Technological University as a senior researcher. And now for past seven years, Sir has joined IIST as a faculty of physics department. The core research interest of Dr. Jinesh is future memory technologies and thin film electronics. He has published nearly 60 international research papers and has 12 patents. He is passionate about teaching physics and actively participates in school and college programs for spreading interest in learning physics. So welcome, sir, and students grab the opportunity. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So I will share my screen now. Okay, good afternoon. Yes, yes sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think this is the last day of uh, the program at uh, Sargat Shaitra. So every day we used to, uh, every year we used to uh, participate with, uh, part participate in this program uh, and interact with a lot of students like you. So um, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Sargat Shetra and uh, uh, all the active members of uh, Sargat Shetra for hosting this uh, this event at this time also. Last year also I, I, I was, uh, I, I have been giving a talk in uh, Sargat Shetra uh, about uh, microscopy. Um, I think, uh, yeah, similar topics is, is, is coming here. Uh, the topic of my uh, talk today is, is uh, about the art of becoming a physicist. Uh, I thought that becoming a physicist uh, is, is, is more about uh, uh, career opportunities, right? So I just uh, changed the title a little bit. This is uh, about art of being a um, uh, physicist. Okay, some slight changes. So what is the art of being a physicist? So as a physicist and uh, um, as an inventor, if you, if, you, if you do art or what kind of art you are doing in every day. And this is an interesting topic, I think, uh, especially in this uh, era, because now we know that you see um, with a small virus, how the world has changed already, right? And this happens once in a while in, in, uh, in, in human history, for example, um, uh, some of the greatest inventions were, were, were uh, coming out during the time of world wars. 
one of such uh, uh, in, uh, inventions is is uh, our transistors you know the transistors how it was working we had vacuum tubes earlier and now it became transistors the transistor was one of the war emergency at that time around uh, around 60 to 65 years ago just like that we we are entering into a new era of uh, technology now because of a small virus it's not a world war but it's uh, almost similar to to a world war uh, in this case only human on one side and virus on the other side so now you see we are entering into the world of artificial intelligence and we are uh, entering into the time of um, remote uh, communications just like that I maybe mean, never thought that we will be meeting like this in a classroom where the classroom is spread all, all over the maybe india or the world okay so this kind of a technology evolution uh, or evolution in technology and science and its applications these are all coming in uh, in human nature okay so let's take it as a positive okay let it, let's take it positively so the art of um, being a physicist i just wanted to introduce a few very few concepts about uh, how artistic our phys physics and scientists were it is not about just physics okay physics is only only a term which i used to here to mention all the to cover all the scientists and technologists in in this in this uh, era okay so um I'll, let me see what what we have here um and before going to the talk I, i will just introduce myself you have seen me okay you have seen me my research group in iest is dealing with the electronic materials okay materials used for electronic applications future applications you will all know um this kind of things later on okay when, when you when you come to colleges and when you come to universities this kind of research you will you will come these are specialized uh, uh, research but first you learn physics and chemistry and science all all the uh, all the basic science you learn and then you come to specializations so we have specialized in materials for used for electronics okay so what do we do one, one of the things we do is actually to uh, to study about uh, or research about memory devices our future memory technology okay we, we don't have much time to talk about all these things so memory technology means so you know that i mean 10 years ago or 15 years ago we had uh, hard disks uh, cds were there then dvds were there now we don't see these kind of things anymore we are actually dealing with the uh, usb sticks right pen drives so the technology is tremendously changing and the amount of data we can store in a small area is increasing so we are at almost uh, reaching a limit of uh, uh, storing data okay that is where we have to research more on what are the new possible technologies where we, we can store even more data okay. you see if you take uh, our mobile phones we are taking phones uh, uh, to everywhere and we are taking photos everywhere you see most of the photos we don't even use okay we take if you see a um, situation we take a photo maybe five or 10 photos we will take but one may be useful the rest of the nine is, is is just remaining there for years and you don't even care about that until you have a space problem or a storage a space problem which means that uh, we in our future uh, in, in our in our future we will be dealing with the terabits of uh, memory it's not uh, megabytes or uh, gigabytes it will be terabits or even even larger so that's what that's what uh, one of our areas where we are dealing with and very interestingly as i told you where wherever we can introduce art into the science or wherever we can link art and science that would be a wonderful that will give wonderful results for example if you just imagine how we are thinking and if we can create electronic um, uh, counterparts okay just like our brain if we can create a brain out of silicon or electronic networks that would be wonderful we think okay because um, because we have something called artificial intelligence coming up so there is a new type of computation computers coming which are which are actually equivalent to um, to our human brain and that is called neuromorphic te technology neuromorphic means neurons we are imitating neurons and that technology is very useful for the upcoming artificial um, artificial intelligence technology okay so that's what we are working on we also work on some thing film transistors um, which are all related topics and we are also working on some uh, microscopy to see atoms and to build up things from atomic scale and then study the properties of materials from atomic scale like that okay um um so i assume that you, you have learned basic basic physics so you are you are a class from which and which uh, from until 10 or 
Are you from class 10th or? It is 10 to 12. 10 to 12, okay. Uh, wonderful. So you will understand most of the things what I'm talking about. So the things, uh, the research, most of our research is happening uh, with these three people. They are the PhD candidates, PhD scholars. So that, that's about it. Okay. Now let's, let's uh, come back to our uh, talk. What is an art? So art, I, I can immediately to, to get rid of conflicts, I can just take a, a definition which is already existing. An art is an expression um, uh, or application of human creative skill and imagination producing works to be appreciated mainly for their beauty or emotional power. Okay, that, that's the Oxford Dictionary, or if you look at the Wikipedia or Google Dictionary, this is what, what you what you actually see. Okay, what is the what 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 does art doing here? Uh, do, do here? So that's actually the theme of our discussion. Basically, is about art is an inevitable part of great science. Okay, I'm not uh, saying that great science will be produced only by art, but no. Uh, the thing is that most of our inventions there is an artistic mind behind it. So these are these are just. Uh, um, when you when you see certain things, you you would you would be wondering why people are doing this. Okay, I will show uh, a few examples like this. Why people are doing this? I mean, there is not no connections between science and and, and uh, their experiments. But you will see that later on that how revolutionized the, the science uh, quite a lot. Okay, and there are connections between artistic um, science work and applications we are using today. That, that's what I wanted to say. Okay. The famous guy we know, I, I'm, unfortunately, I cannot ask who it is because uh, I mean, otherwise uh, our network will be jammed. You know that this is Richard Feynman, right? Richard Feynman, as I or most of the people can consider, is one of the greatest minds in physics. Uh, if you haven't uh, started uh, reading Feynman's lectures, you should do because Feynman lectures are uh, lectures on basic physics, beautifully explained in ways. Uh, that everyone can understand in layman, layman's la uh, language, let's, let's say. Okay, Richard Feynman was not only just a scientist who won Nobel Prize, but he is also a revolutionary thinker who could predict a lot of things about the future, uh, future of science. Okay, that's why, and he has a lot of quotes. Uh, if, you, if you look, at, look in, if you just uh, do a Google search in, in, in Feynman's quotes, you can, you can actually say a lot of motivating quotes. Uh, and uh, um, Okay, so um, one important thing about Feynman is that in uh, 1959, 1959 December, so some people say 1960, okay. And in 59 December, 29th, you see just a two uh, days before the new year, he gave a talk, a revolutionary talk in American, American Physical Society meeting, APS meeting, which was uh, organized at Caltech in the US. And the title of the talk was, there is plenty of room at the bottom. Okay, what, what, what is he meaning about? There is plenty of room means there's, there are a lot of opportunities. Okay, plenty of room means there are a lot of opportunities at the bottom. At the bottom of what? We are not talking about a sea, or we are not talking about a lake or something. We are talking about a sea which is science. Okay, so we have, we are, we are actually floating and we are actually swimming on the surface of the sea of science, but there is plenty of room at the bottom. If you, if you go there, that means if you, if you cut down materials, if you cut down the dimensions into smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, take atoms, okay, and then start building from there instead of taking a material and uh, taking something and crushing down to, to atoms, you take atoms and start building up from there. You will have a wonderful world, you have a lot of opportunities. That's what uh, Feynman is talking about. Basically, he is talking about very, 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 very small or physics at very, very, very small scales or what we have generally heard uh, or hearing now, he's talking about the nanotechnology. Okay, technology at the nano level. You know what is nano means, right? Nano means 10 raised to minus nine is, uh, nano comes from nine. Okay, so uh, in nanotechnology or nano science, what we are referring is to a length of 10 raised to minus nine meters. Okay, one meter divided by 10 raised to nine. So that means it's of the order of uh, the size of uh, one or two atoms. So Feynman, okay. So I'm going to show you um, um, one letter or, or a, a small passage uh, uh, given by, uh, uh, given in Feynman's lecture on that day, this is the uh, lecture which is entitled, There is plenty of room at the bottom. Okay, I'm going to show uh, one uh, 
passage from there. You see, this is the, it's very difficult to read. Okay, I will tell you the reason why it is difficult to read. This is a, a, a passage from his speech. Okay, so as soon as I mention these, people tell me about miniaturization and, 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 and a, lot of, a lot of things are written there. Uh, two things are important in this, in this passage. You see, they tell me about electric motors that are the size of the nail on your small finger. Okay, He's in 1959, 1960, he is actually talking about a motor which, which, which will have the size of the nail of our small finger. Okay, so that means that uh, motor which is miniaturized. So you see the second uh, line itself shows a uh, word is called miniaturization. Okay, miniaturize. Miniaturize means whatever we see, we miniaturize into small. That takes enormous effort, a lot of research, and a lot of instrumentation is needed. For example, a motor which is running. If you want to make a motor which is which is of the of the size of uh, of, of the nail of the small finger, okay. So, so how much research it, it will take? And he is saying that it's already existing at the 1960s. Okay. You see the second line. They tell me by which you can write the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. So if you take a pin, a sharp pin, and on the head, on the tip of that uh, of that pin, can we write the Lord's Prayer? Lord's Prayer is is is, is just a um, uh, what's called um, um, an indication, or a, uh, it's just to show that a passage of a, of a uh, letter or a, or, a, or a paragraph we can write on top of a pin. Okay, take a sharp pin a needle, and on top of that, on the at the edge of the, or at the, at the, at the uh, tip of that. We can write a passage. Can we write a passage, or can we develop our uh, our technology to uh, to, uh, to a way that we can write on the tip of a needle? Okay. He is also telling at the end uh, in the year two thousand, when we look back to uh, uh, when we look when they look back at that stage, they will wonder why it was not until the year nineteen sixties. That means uh, why it is not developed until so. What was preventing? Uh, doing all these things at this age. So you see, writing, making a, a motor of that small size, of the size of a nail, and writing at the at the tip of a needle, these are, I, I would say, these are art, okay, most, mostly. Why do you write on the tip of a, of, of a needle? You write on the tip of a needle because you want to develop capabilities such that you can actually control or you can write things, or you can carve things, or you can make structures at that level. Okay, and this passage, as I told, uh, as I told you, is, is difficult to read because uh, now in 2020s, when, when we are when we are sitting now, this passage is written like that. Okay, so I'm just uh, giving, giving to show you something. This is the actual passage. You see, there uh, there are some additional uh, symbols. Okay. Um, but you see, on top is that two arrows on a parallel line, and it shows 60 nanometer. Okay, so this passage is now difficult to read because these are written using atoms. Okay, atoms or molecules. So we are already where uh, Feynman um, uh, has en envisaged, and. But what it means, okay, you see on top there is a, um, a 60 nanometer, and, and on the at the bottom you can see there's a 400 nanometer. Okay, which means that you see what is 60 nanometer? 60 nanometer is around uh, you say 50 atoms or 100 atoms mostly. Okay, so we are talking about 100 atoms we can manipulate. Okay, that means if you, if I take it tip of a needle and if I write this passage, I don't need the tip of a, uh, of a needle completely. Okay, I need a very small area on the tip of a needle to write this passage. That is the capability of science today. Okay, so you see, this, is, this, is, this just gives a, an example of where art is connecting to science. Okay, and this, uh, whatever is written here, even though slightly difficult to read, this is an artistic impression of what we can do at this moment. Okay, with the, our um, our technologies. So this is where I wanted to connect science and art, and how art art is a demonstration in science. Art is a demonstration of our capability. Okay, that, that's all what I wanted to say. So how this is written, using what type of uh, uh, technology this is written, I will tell you in the coming slides. Okay. Okay. So this is a hundred uh, atoms. So that 
uh, L, okay, that the people is there. So people, uh, the L of that people, that the width of that L is only 60 nanometer. 60 nanometer means less than 100 atoms. Okay, so we can manipulate atoms and we can write things using atoms and uh, that is the, that's the capability. And what is the use of it? We will see later on. Okay, just writing is not the use of it. This is a demonstration, artistic demonstration. Now we are actually going to, uh, to see what are the applications of this technology. Okay, we are actually using this technology quite a lot in our day-to-day -day -day life, in our mobile phones. Okay, but we don't know how this were used. Uh, we were using this. Okay, just uh, just to tell about miniaturization, which was in the second line of that that uh, that, uh, that page. So miniaturization, one example I am I'm just showing here. Usually I, I show this example everywhere because this is the best example we can we can see now. You see, this is a first generation of an instrument. We know it's a first generation computer. Okay, and around the 1950s. So you see, this is the second generation of a computer. Second generation means now you see we have already. Um, uh, miniaturized space. You see the first first version. That entire room full of instrument is one computer. When it comes to the second generation, it has reduced its size. It's almost in the span of uh, ten years that reduced its size. And it is it was called a computer because it was used to do computation, okay, or cal or calculations. So basically, basically, its function was just above the calculator we are uh, commonly using, not a scientific cal calculator, a normal calculator. But you see the instrumentation was so diverse, so big, and then in time it, it uh, reduced. And you see, when we come to um, uh, third generation, we have a screen, we have a monitor, we can, we can actually type in uh, information there. We can get out the processed information in the form of, uh, of, of a screen. And in the fourth generation, I have used the fourth generation. I started using fourth generation, okay, so um, uh, in my universities. And then you see we have much more uh, delicacies there. And fifth generation is what at the moment we are using. You see, fifth generation means that entire room. Okay, fifth, fifth generation, for example, I, I would say fifth generation. It, it is it is now in the Apple for, uh, uh, Apple um, uh, computer. You see that entire room has shrunk to a very small, what's called screen. Okay. And the first generation computer was, was used to, to, uh, to do computations, calculations, but the fifth generation computers, we don't, we don't use uh, computers just for calculations. We use it for watching movies, games, videos, uh, music is there. A lot of complex, very complex computations we can do. A lot of things we can do. We can store um, uh, images or data, process data. We can do a lot of, lot of, lot of things using our present day computer. So you see, from a very large um, uh, space, which was occupied, occupied by the first uh, computer, now we are into a very small, small miniaturized uh, system where we can do much more and a lot of other things. Okay, so that is that is what is called the miniaturization. And you, if you look at the time scale of how, how long it took uh, to, to get, get into here, it's almost 60 years. And 60 years is not a big, deal in, in the evolution history of human beings of millions of years, right? 60 years is just, uh, just like a, uh, just like a uh, flash. So you see, this is, this is one of the examples of miniaturization from a big uh, event. We are actually coming to a, a smaller one. And uh, let's see. Okay, so if I put, uh, take the latest computer and, and put it in their uh, old computer, it is as small as this. But you see the functionalities are totally different, right? Our sixth generation is supposed to be artificial intelligence. And this is exactly where this, this particular time, the corona time uh, uh, is leading us to. Okay, Artificial intelligence is, now we are, uh, we are done with the miniaturization of computer. So computer, we don't have to miniaturize further because it, it has already reached a limit of its, uh, its, its, uh, its, its size. Because if it is much smaller, I mean, we don't know how to do that. We can even do most of the functions of a computer in a, mobile phone now, or in a watch, uh, the latest watch now. Okay, so we don't have to actually uh, go for uh, further miniaturization there, but what we actually want to do is further developments in the um, in the log logics of, of, of that computer. Okay, so that's, that's where sixth generation is, is related to, to, the, to the, the software part of that, and it will be mostly artificial intelligence. You know that artificial intelligence 
is 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 actually intelligence, electronic intelligence, which which actually is used to, to predict things or to give suggestions. We we are actually using it quite a lot. Where, for example, when you are typing in Google, you are type, typing something halfway, Google will suggest but a, a, a list of things uh, to see whether this this is the, this is what you want or, or like that. Okay, so that is actually artificial intelligence. If you order food in uh, uh, using um, uh, any apps, okay, any any uh, anything, it will immediately tell you what are the restaurants around you. Okay, so that's that's the artificial intelligence because you are getting suggestions. Okay, you don't have to worry about uh, which one is good, which, which one I have to look for. No, there are suggestions. You just pick up from them. So artificial intelligence is going to be very uh, crucial in, in the, in the uh, upcoming uh, technology. I'm giving here one example. Okay, again, we are coming to art. You see uh, six uh, beautiful faces here. Okay, the interesting thing about these these faces is that these are faces of human beings who do not exist. Okay. That's the interesting thing because uh, these are faces of people who do not exist, and, what, and, uh, and, and you see how realistic it is, how beautifully uh, or how original it is. <clears throat> now, if I am saying that these people do not exist, what does it mean? Artificial intelligence is capable of, uh, as I told you, suggesting things, and what, what uh, they have done actually is that they have collected the faces of millions of people, so they have database of uh, millions of faces uh, all around the globe. And they have compiled it, it according to the ethnicity of, of faces. For example, American faces, Chinese faces, African faces, Indian faces, like that they have actually uh, made different, different uh, um, segments. So from that, you can, you can actually do a, um, a compilation of a new face, okay? Which, which will have that ethnicity of a particular person. For example, a Chinese face um, will have certain features other than an American face or an Indian face. Okay. So using those particular ethnicity, you can actually create uh, millions of faces which do not exist. Okay. The interesting thing is that this, uh, this the site of uh, the, the site you can actually in this site, for example, the, the site name is the person. This person does not exist. Com. Okay. If you go there, you can actually see millions of faces which uh, do not actually exist. And this database was created by Philip Wang, a software engineer at Uber, and um, uh, and, and in, in their research lab, actually. Okay. So what is interesting here is that you, you see, I mean, if, if you look at these faces, for example, look at the first face, you can see that uh, by choice, by this uh, permutation and comb combinations of uh, features, you see the earrings on left and right; they are different. And that is that's the case of uh, most of uh, most of the faces here. For example, just below that, on the last face, that uh, uh, right face, you see one ear has a earring. There, other uh, earring, uh, another ear does not have an earring. Okay, that actually comes from the combinations. Okay, that itself shows the authenticity of, of the images. So, which actually means that maybe maybe in future our movies will be created by newcomers. Okay, which are you know, which are do not exist. Okay, so this kind of interesting applications are there for uh, for uh, artificial intelligence. Okay, just just to show one example. Okay, so is it easy to transform our brain into an electronic brain, or how capable is our brain comparing to an electronic brain? Okay, that that is been the, that's the basic question when we talk about artificial intelligence. Okay, this talk is not about artificial intelligence. I'm just uh, telling. Some of the complexities and some of the artistic forms which are come, coming from this particular example. It's actually not easy to create a brain out of, out, out of computers because our brain is much, much, much more powerful than any computer, any supercomputer which is existing. I'll show you one example. IBM simulated the functioning of a cat's brain. A cat, its brain, some of the functions IBM created to do that, okay, not not the not the simulation of a complete cat's brain, but uh, some functions of a cat's brain. IBM had to use two supercomputers for Blue Gene, and they they contains one lakh forty seven thousand four hundred fifty six computers, okay, in a row, with one forty four terabit of memory. So that much 
huge computational power was needed to simulate the functioning of a cat's brain, some of the some of the functioning of a cat's brain. So such a complex thing is what is what is our brain is, what our brain is. Okay. So replacing a human brain by electronics is, is at the moment totally out of question. But that is that, that we don't know how to do. Anyway, we have brain. So why we have to, call, to create again a complex brain out of uh, computers? No, that is not the purpose. But if you if you look at that, how our brain is functioning, we can actually uh, use the way our neurons are functioning, how we remember things, how memory is stored in in our uh, brain, and how we are using that to process data. That is a new type of that leads to a new type of uh, computation called neuromorphic computation, as I told uh, in the beginning. Okay. So what is the Net, what is the future of, uh, of, of these things? You have, um, uh, you know what I'm coming to. So you see, there's an ideal handshaking. That means an ideal um, collaboration between electronics, physics, chemistry, engineering, design, everything is there. Okay. And I did not uh, write art there because the art is already there in the last word, this uh, design. Okay. So design is an inevitable and essential part of science now. And we know that we have information technology there. And as a combination of all these things, we have a new technology. And you might know Sophia, right? Sophia is, a, is, is, is one of the first, no, the, not one of the, Sophia is the first humanoid to get a citizenship. She's a robot. She can do or almost uh, 62 facial expressions. She can answer questions, very uh, intellectual um, answers. You can actually uh, see those answers or, or these interviews in, in YouTube. I, I would encourage you to go there and see the conversation between this robot, humanoid robot, and 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 men. She said yesterday I was watching a, a YouTube uh, video, uh, which, which was actually a conversation between a man and and Sophia, and. Uh, um, she's actually asking the man, how, "How sure are you that you are not a robot?" Okay. So this kind of intellectual discussions you can actually see in, in, in YouTube. So Sophia is one of the uh, examples of artificial intelligence and how it is going and uh, where it is going. Okay. Uh, this robot is not a self-thinking robot. I mean, uh, uh, the, co the consciousness part. Okay. We all have consciousness. That is the property of a living body. Electronics does not have its own consciousness. It has data stored in it, and whatever comes out is a process. Is the result of the data processed, right? Uh, so, so like that only. So Sophia also gives answers, but uh, but it's not from a, a, a consciousness as such. But that is why that is where actually technology is leading to. Okay. So we don't have to go there because that is uh, that's too much. Another example of uh, miniaturization is, is memory. Uh, this also I used to show in all all the uh, talks. So you see, in 1956, a five MB hard disk. 5 MB, you know, 5 MB is, is the size of a normal um, film song you save. Okay, if you, if, you, if you save a film movie song, that's about 5 MB. So this was the size of the hard disk, and it was called a supercomputer at that time. 1956, this was the biggest uh, achievement in electronics, a 5 MB hard disk. Okay, and you can see it is uh, getting shipped in um, uh, to, to transport to, to somewhere else. But after 60 years now, in a, say 19, uh, 2011, we have almost 256 GB. 256 GB we have on our thumb. So that is, again, just like a computer, which was a room full of uh, machines uh, uh, in front to uh, a small panel, we have this huge memory, which is shrunk to a small area. Okay. This is also very important because uh, memory is, an, is a very important part of uh, our uh, artificial intelligence applications, which is coming in the future. Okay. Because just like uh, we, we are connecting things uh, and coming into a conclusion, that's, uh, that's basically the, uh, the, the whole idea about uh, consciousness, right? We, are, we have data and we are connecting it, and the output of how we are connecting it is, is called the, 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 the intelligence, what we are talking about. So in artificial intelligence also, we have to store a lot of data, a lot of memory is needed for that. And using that, they are actually uh, processing it. Okay. Another a small example is uh, mobile phones. Probably you know who is this. This is this guy. You should know the name of this guy because we are all using mobile phones. This is Martin Cooper, the inventor of cell phones. So he's, and that, he's uh, holding 
the first mobile phone he invented and the latest oh, at that time you know every mobile phones are changing so we cannot say that okay this is the latest phone no latest phone is yet to come so you see these are the two uh, varieties and you can actually see a lot of uh, different 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 uh, uh, evolution in mobile phones okay so let's say so and and uh, the latest mobile phone let's say it is included already in a watch so we can use a now we are not uh, in, the, in the first mobile phone we, we are using a first mobile phone for only communicating and the range was only 100 meters but that's not the case now now we are using mobile phone calling is one of the rare functions of a mobile phone okay communication we use it for entertainments we we hear music we uh, see tvs we have camera there lot of photos there now we have health monitoring coming up for example if, if a person is there with a, a heart problem um, we can actually put a small locket there which, which can actually uh, sense the heartbeat and then if there is any abnormalities in the heartbeat it will alarm it will give an alarm to the to the mobile uh, it, it will give a signal to the mobile phone mobile phone or watch will give an alarm so which means that uh, now health monitoring also is there in the in the watches and then inform information uh, internet we can connect with uh, all type of facebook whatsapp all these things are actually um, connecting to outside so back to this uh, problem, this, this slide again. So what we are actually telling is, I was telling that this, this particular passage was written using a particular technology. So this is to show that we are capable of manipulating atoms and molecules to do things, to make things, to make applications. So how this was done? How from molecules this uh, particular passage was written? Okay. So how was it done? This, uh, this was done at the lab of uh, Professor Chad Milton, uh, Northwestern University. So his research group is actually actively working on how to make uh, these kind of structures, very, very small structures. And this is not to just write passages on a, on, at the tip of a pen or like that. It has tremendous, tremendous applications. I will show one of the applications. So you see, this is called big pen nanolithography. Okay. See, this is basically a dip pen. Uh, what is dip pen? We use uh, in olden times. Uh, we, we have a pen which, which we have to dip in the ink and then we have to write again, dip it, write it, dip it, write it like that. So, this is something like that, but uh, on an atomic scale or a nano scale. Okay, this is a tip of a particular instrument called atomic force microscope. It's a very sharp tip. What you see here is a, it's a very sharp tip, and uh, there is a reservoir of certain molecules there at the top of the tip. Now what, what happens as you move this tip away, what happens is that this ink slowly comes to the surface and that's, that ink contains molecules which can align on the surface and you can write anything on the surface using these aligned molecules. Molecules, this, these are particular type of molecules and these are particular type of substrates, these are particular type of uh, specific type, type of um, needles. So using this, we can actually make standing molecules on top of uh, surfaces. This technology, you will come to, uh, to this later on. This technology is called the deep pen nanolithography. And this molecule assembly is called uh, self-assembly. That means um, by certain fundamental rules of uh, physics, these molecules will not fall down. It will stand up like this. Okay. So uh, that type of molecules are there. And using this, you can write anything, right? You can, you can write um, um, uh, passages like that, but, but that is not the, uh, the actual application of it. You can actually create circuits at a nano level. Suppose you have a very, 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 very small transistor, which is of the size of, uh, uh, say, uh, a few nanometers. Actually, uh, nearly five years ago, the size of a transistor was 40 nanometer. Okay. What is 40 nanometer? 40 nanometer is around roughly the size of a virus. Okay, let's say coronavirus. 100 to uh, uh, 50 nanometer is the size of a coronavirus. That is the size of a transistor we are using now. And if this is the size of the transistors, how do we connect these transistors uh, each other so that we, can, we have a circuit? Okay, we have to connect transistors. Then only we will have a circuit, then only we can use it for applications. Those, so these kind of nano connections are generally I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big challenge to, to create these kind of um, uh, connections. 
and different nanolithography can do that because it's a it is connecting la, uh, uh, between transistors or, or devices using these small lines which we can actually write using this particular uh, technology okay one example i will i will show you this is uh, a, an image created by deep pen nanolithography by um, a star in singapore a star is a, is a, is a research um, organization in singapore so they have they have created a beautiful face out of it and uh, if you if you if you just uh, take a uh, printout of any, any anything okay and if you look at what is the maximum resolution you have that is 300 dpi okay what is dpi if you take 1 inch there will be 300 dots so if you print out something from a printer you'll have maximum 300 dpi that means you have 300 dots there and that that is what you are uh, when you look from away or when you are looking at you don't see the distance or the gap between the dots so you will see that if you if you for example um, for example look at this screen so i have written something there normal images have resolution look at that n for example it has certain resolution if you go zoom in zoom in zoom in using a microscope you can see that these are individual pixels okay so this pixel, if you want to see these pixels, you don't have to zoom in. You just put a drop of water on your mobile phone and, and see on the screen. You can see the pixels okay? because water, drop, water droplet is like a lens. You can see it and, and uh, enlarge. Okay. So these are pixels, basically. So basically, uh, 300 dpi means 300 dots. That dot can be uh, printed dot. It can, uh, when you are printing it on a paper, it can be pixel when you are uh, watching it on, 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 on a screen. But the resolution of this image is 10 raised to 6, that means 10 lakh, okay, 1 million dots per inch. Which means that you keep on enlarging this image, it, it will still have the clarity. Okay, it, it will still remain with its original um, uh, resolution. So you can, you can take a snap and you um, save it with this uh, resolution. You can keep on zooming it and you can see with, uh, the, the details of that, 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 uh, that particular photo with, still with the same clarity. So that is one of the applications. So I told you in the beginning, showing this that uh, we can write a passage of uh, Feynman is is just an artistic, uh, not just it is an artistic view or artistic uh, uh, impression of what we can do or we are capable of. Okay. So if you do this kind of uh, things, we can in, in future you will have very high resolution images, very high resolution cameras. These are all possible. Okay. So you, you saw where, where is the application coming from. Now we are back to, again, the same thing. Okay, he's, he's telling that okay, the, the, the second line, which, uh, the second point which I have uh, underlined. You see, it's written that they tell me by which you can write the, the Lord's Prayer on the head of a pin. Okay, so writing, can we write something on the head of a pin? If you take a ballpoint pen, and you, you know that there's a minute, uh, millimeter scale, millimeter uh, long, or uh, diameter ball is there. Okay, in, in my um, uh, what's called childhood, we used to after finishing writing, we used to take, we used to rub this uh, um, refill on a floor that you get this ball comes out. Okay, we used, used to take it and, and see. I think I mean we don't have to do anything but to see what type of ball it is. So you see that ball at the top, at the tip of the ballpoint pen, is is a very very small. It's a Less than a micro, uh, less than a millimeter. Okay, so the question is whether we can write a passage on top of that ball. Again, it's an artistic view, it's an artistic uh, job to do, but that is not what we want to do here. By writing that, again, we can do certain other things, a lot of other things. So you see, what I'm showing here is a ballpoint pen. There's a ball at the tip. If I uh, look at this ball using a microscope, it looks like this, right? So that's a, that's the ball, and the and there's sphere is there. The rest is uh, underneath the, the tip. If I look again, this with a very high resolution, very powerful electron microscope, that will look like this. Okay. Now you see I have again zoomed in, zoomed in such so that I can actually see the peaks and uh, valleys and, and hills, all these things on the on the surface of that that ball. You see, uh, the total image size itself is sixty thousand nanometer. Okay, or 60 micrometer. What is 60 micrometer? You know, approximately um, that is almost the diameter of our hair. Okay, if you take one hair, the diameter is around 50 to 100 uh, micrometer. So that is uh, the size of that entire image now. 
And if I take that uh, previous passage and put it there, that will be as small as like this. Okay, so you see that green, other than blue uh, shade there. That will be the passage. So writing Lord Square on the tip of a uh, pen or a tip of a needle is not at all a difficult task nowadays. Okay. So that's where we are actually coming to. Again, a wonderful art which, which was shown by a, a research institute in Israel. What they have done is that, you see, um, there's a finger, right? And on, uh, on top of the finger, there's a minute point. <clears throat> that's a piece of silicon. Okay, that's a very small piece of silicon. And they're trying to, they, they put, uh, uh, this thing is a, it's called a tweezer, using a tweezer. They just put, they took that and put it on a, uh, on a finger. Now, what is the importance of this thing? So Feynman was talking about writing a passage on top of a tip, but the entire Bible is written on top of that, uh, that, that small piece, that small dust here. Okay, so it's a Jewish Bible. The entire Jewish Bible with the 1.2 million letters, three lakh words has been written totally on, that, on the top of that small, small, small area. And the area is, you see, it's only um, 0 0.04 uh, millimeters square area. Okay, that means uh, 0.2 millimeter by 0.2 millimeter area. We can't, we can't even see that uh, normally. On top of that, uh, the entire Bible has been written. So that is the technology. Again, it's an artistic view. It's, a, it's an art. What, what do we do with this art? It's not to do anything. This is the smallest Bible existing in the world. And I think uh, in near future, even a smaller Bible is not going to come because the entire Bible is written on, on top of that small dust. Okay. So what is the technology we use? And what is the use of such, such kind of an art here? Okay. So how they have done this is, uh, that also I will, I will tell, they coated gold on top of uh, silicon, a very thin gold, and then using electron as a beam. Okay. Uh, you might know how earlier we were, we were writing things. We, we had these palm leaves, dry palm leaves, and we had sharp um, uh, called pen without any ink, it's a, it's a sharp needles, and we usually, usually scribe on top of that. Okay, so um, that is, that's called lithography. Okay, that's a kind of lithography. Lithography means, litho means stone, graphy means graph, graphically we write something. So carving on the stone and in the ancient age, that is called lithography, okay. But we, we don't use stone here, we use electron beams, and a small electron beams going to the uh, polygon on, on, on the gold, which is coated on top of the silicon. We can remove atoms by atom and you can write it. So you see, if you want to write the entire Bible on, on top of such an area, how much time it might have consumed, right? So how much time, patience, effort, everything is there. But this is to demonstrate that this is our capability of dealing with uh, things. Okay, so art here is again a demonstration of our capability. Okay, now let's see um, what we are going to do with this uh, this technology. So, you see, I'm talking about electron beams. Okay, how to use electron beams and how to uh, use it for different different applications. This is one of our in, uh, older generation TV. Now, I don't think uh, um, people will have it because this is the, the last generation TV. Now we have very, very flat screen TVs. If you, if, you, if you open the cage and look at it, the backside of the TV looks like this. This is called the CRT, cathode ray tube. So here, a very high potential is applied and it's, uh, it's, it's actually creating an electron beam here. And basically the image we see is actually the electron beam, which is actually scanning over, scanning through uh, the, the TV screen. That's how we see the image of it. So it's called a raster scan scanning because it goes there, comes back, goes there, comes back. So we actually see uh, the image which is coming on, on, the, on the screen. And the scanning is so fast that we cannot see that, okay, we, 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 don't, we do not see that uh, it is image by image, but it's actually like by video. Okay. So let's see, this is an electron beam. How to create an electron beam? That's, that's simple. Actually, people have created this even in the last and last, um, century, uh, already in the 19th century, people have created electron beams. So this is not a big issue. How you, how you can do that? This is a vacuum tube, a tube, a, a glass bottle where, I mean, air has been pumped out as much as possible. And then you have two electrodes there. Electrodes means this is a metal coin 
and this is another metal coin and these metal coins are connected by a very high voltage don't try this out because it's a high voltage okay you can you will do experiments related to this later on when you come to uh, science labs so um, now what happens you see there's a very large potential or voltage between these two we know if there is a large voltage what happens spark happens spark happens when there is a little bit of air in it so now what happens is that we have removed the air as much as possible so what is coming out is not uh, the spark because of ions it's not like that i mean uh, the spark uh, the best example of a spark is is a lightning you see because of the the, the uh, charge accumulated in the cloud and earth is there grounding so it actually uh, make a spark and that spark is what we see as lightning but that is a different thing that is that creates ions but here it is basically electrons which is actually jump, jumping out of the negative you see it's connected to negative okay this is a negative side of the battery this is a positive side so from negative something is coming out and suppose there is a hole in the middle of this this uh, uh, electrode this metal what happens electrons will simply pass through it okay so you get a beam of electrons and that beam of electron is what is um uh, what is happening in our old uh, tvs okay it's not only tvs or uh, old computer screens uh, in the lab we we have cathode ray tubes crt monitors okay this kind of old type of monitors you, you might have seen the um uh, the oscilloscope monitors in the hospitals where this heart beats are coming okay these are all uh, this electron beams which are actually falling when the electron beams fall on a fluorescent screen it creates light there and that's how we get a pixel there okay so this is basically um electron beam now you see if you put uh, a magnet or if you put another voltage across it okay plus here negative here if you put a electric field across it you can actually deflect this beam that's how you scan it you just put an electric field you can actually scan it okay you just put an ac electric field what happens the, the electron beam will deflect like this and you can scan on on the surface of the tv or whichever instrument you are using okay so this is only this abc are only to show that okay, we can we can uh, deflect this wave to uh, any anywhere we want depending upon um, the electric field we are applying so just by using electric field or a, or a voltage there you can deflect this thing okay so this is how most of our uh, devices are now working so the discovery of electron was actually using this setup you know that jj thompson discovered the electrons uh, only in the last century okay so around 10 kilovolt of uh, voltage is applied there to, to create this electron beam okay so electrons flow from the plate connected to the negative terminal of the battery and it, when this beam comes out it creates a current in the circuit so since it is uh, coming from electricity those particles which are emitting out of uh, the negative side were, were called electrons okay so electricity the particles which carry electric electricity or electric charges that's called electrons so it also has another name it's called cath cath uh, cathode rays cathode rays means um, the negative electrode is called cathode positive electrode is called anode so when ele since electrons are jumping out of the of the cathode negative it's called cathode rays that's why it's called cathode ray tubes okay so that that's the history now if we take this electron beam and you focus it you see if sunlight is there if you have um, a small lens we can actually collimate we can focus this uh, sunlight into a small point right and we can actually burn maybe cotton or, or or things like that so that means the light is focusing there like that uh, if you are using electromagnetic uh, plates there or electrical plates there we can actually collimate this electron beam into a very small area and we can actually uh, focus this electrons into extremely small areas now what will happen just like sunlight which is focused by uh, a lens which is creating at that focal point you know it is heating up just like that if you put all these electrons collimated into a single spot what happens is that it will burn whatever is there because electrons are very powerful okay electron beam is very powerful much more powerful energetic than our uh, sun, sun sun rays so what happens is that wherever it falls it will burn like that if it falls on a thin coating of a uh, gold that gold atoms will will be warm right 
So if you just uh, use another electron, uh, electron magnet or electric field to deflect these things, okay, this, this uh, polymeric beam, you can write whatever you want. Now you don't have to put, uh, sit there and, and, uh, and uh, deflect these things like that. And everything is computerized. You just give the passage in the form of whatever is whatever to be written in the computer program. It will transform uh, into a program and it will control the, the elect electron beams. It will write whatever is there. Okay. So now nowadays it's not a big issue to write on at the tip of a, uh, of a, of a pen or, uh, or a needle. Okay. So this is called electron lithography. Electron lithography. So you can uh, make extremely small features out of uh, using ele uh, electron beams. Okay. So basically you burn things out, you evaporate things out, and you can create structures or whatever. Um, uh, features you want on the surface. Now, what is the advantage of these things? So let's see, this is the elect basic electron beam. Now, if you have imagination about what to do with this uh, electron beam, you can create a lot of technologies. What type of technologies? When I saw, when I showed it now, we can create electron beam lithography. You can write extremely small things. Okay, it has its own applications. Okay, and we are using in our day daily life all these applications. So this is an electron beam. Um, Let's say, yeah. So using that electron beam, we have a TV. Okay, using the same electron beam, now we have a CR a computer monitor, and we have a CRT oscilloscope. Is there? These are all basically from the um, artistic minds of okay people who invented all these things. Basically, there there is just an electron beam. Now, is there any other application for this? Yes. You can also take X-rays. This is how X-rays are generated because these electrons, which are actually coming, they, when they hit a surface, it will. I mean, this, as I told you, these electrons have much more energy than our sunlight. So what happens is that these electrons are energetic. They, when they come and hit. They lose all their energy, and this energy is bursted out as X-rays. This is how X-rays are generated in, a, uh, in in our machines, X-ray machines in hospitals also. So we can create X-rays out of it. And you can use it for a lot of applications, including uh, diagnosis okay, in the hospitals. We, can, we all already have uh, electron beam lithography system there. And uh, let me see. OK. We have one more thing, which is called electron microscope. OK. Electron microscope also we can create. Uh, create. What is electron microscope? That's a microscope which actually uses, uh, which, which has extremely large um, Magnification comparing to normal microscopes. Okay, we'll come to that. So this is uh, our Bible written on top of a small piece of silicon coated with the gold, and using electron beams we scribe it. Okay, that is not the application. That is the art. Okay, that's a demonstration of uh, capability. So art in science is is uh, that's what I said. It's a demonstration of our capability. Okay, it's not just uh, uh, for entertainment. It is the demonstration of our capabilities. Now you see that something called electro microelectromechanical systems. What's microelectromechanical systems or MEMS? These are miniaturized motors. Okay, these are motors of the size of a few micrometers. Now we are talking about um, the, 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 the first point by Feynman. We are telling about motors which are actually of the size of the nails on our small finger, but we are talking about the motors which are of the size of a hair. Okay, of the thickness of a hair. So it is far away, again, far off from what uh, Feynman was telling. So we, are, we have already achieved those. You see, the, this kind of, uh, um, this machinery, small, small machinery, this is a gear system, which was developed by um, Oregon National Lab in US. And you see, this is small gear systems. The size of this gear system is around 600 micrometers, 0.6 millimeter, okay, almost half a millimeter size is the size of the entire. So you see, that, that is the capability. Now we are actually using this kind of MEMS actually a lot in our day-to-day -day life. I will tell, tell a few examples. Okay. Also, this, the transistors we are using in our phone, in our mobile phones, or in our laptops, the size of these uh, things, these instruments or these uh, devices is much, much smaller than what we are thinking. Okay, But, but even we cannot see it with our uh, naked eyes. Okay. So now, what is this uh, electron? Uh, a few examples of uh, uh, applications of uh, 
MEMS, uh, we can see. So this is, these are MEMS. Mainly these are called the capacitive MEM, MEMS because by changing the capacitance, by measuring that change in the capacitance, we can see whether we are moving or not. Okay. One example is, uh, for example, here. Yeah, this is uh, how one capacitive MEMS is working. You see, we, I'm, I'm not very sure whether you have learned all these things already. This is just a capacitor. Okay. You see, the capacitance is between this line and this line. And you know that uh, capacitance is given by K, A divided by D. Okay. What is K? K is the dielectric constant. A is the area. D is the distance between two electrodes. So now you see one set of electrodes are fixed here. Another type of, another set of electrodes, this is green ones. They are moving. Okay. Now what is the advantage of this? Suppose we are not moving this chip. Okay. This it, it is standing still. So what happens? It is in the it, it is in at rest. It is not moving. But the moment we start moving, what happens? This uh, 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 this movable part in the middle it started moving, and there is a change in the capacitance. Now what is the, what is the application of this one? Again, from art we have come come to a small application here. But if I, if I look, look at the application of this one, so we can detect whether something is moving or not. Okay, and this has a lot of applications. The main application is in our airbags. If you put a sudden brake in your car, a bag comes up, right? And that uh, action has to be very fast. That means if you put the brake, sudden brake, the airbag has to come instantaneously, not after five seconds, then it is useless. Okay, people will be already there. So it has to come instantaneously. That means there should be a rapid action that, uh, okay, I put, the, I put the brake and immediately I have um, an airbag, in, airbag com coming up for rescue. And how does the car know that the, uh, the, uh, I have put the accelerator? That means if, when I put a sudden brake, the car is coming into, into a sudden stop. What happens to this uh, capacitor, this moving capacity, capacitor? It, it comes very close to the one of the uh, of this green, uh, the green size, the green needles will come very close to the blue ones. And then there's a sudden change in the capacitance. So electronically, it is transferred to a sensor. So basically, this is a sensor, a moving sensor, a velocity sensor, or acceler accelerometer. That's what we call. Okay, so this is one of the applications of uh, MEMS. What I'm saying is that electron beam lithography, uh, using that, we can write, we can write uh, the entire textbook on top of a silicon, but that is not the uh, application of it. The application of it, it comes here. Okay, by making this kind of small, small chips containing large number of capacitors, we can make, uh, for example, a um, um, uh, sensor uh, accelerometer for, for, uh, for our um, cars. We can also make heartbeat monitors. For example, now our latest um, um, watches, we can actually band, okay, right? We can actually put it on our hand and we can see what is the uh, what is heart rate. Okay, just before the presentation, what was my heart rate? And after that, what is heart, heart rate? Okay, all these things we can actually see. So monitoring the heart, heartbeat also is important. Now, advanced types of stethoscopes are coming where actually we can put a, a small pad on, on our chest and we can see the, the ECG signals very clearly, and we can even see even there is some minutest uh, problem in the heart. We can actually see. Okay, so this is the area where this art is developing into. Okay, and of course in space we have to see the motion of the entire space vehicle, spacecraft. There. Okay, so how do we see that? So we, if you want to monitor what is the velocity, what is the acceleration of our spacecraft, we know we are actually going against the acceleration of Earth. So the speed, the acceleration has to be maintained. So if we want to monitor all these things, again, this technology is used. So you see from a normal hand band to the spacecraft or the space vehicles, we are using same technology of writing um, what's called, a script on top of a needle. Okay, so that, that's the point here. Okay, there are motors of the size of one millimeter. And I don't know whether this is uh, visible to you or if, if Unless you, you have glass band, it may not be easy to see. But you see, the, these are small motors, induction motors. Okay, these are coils. It's basically a coil, but it's very difficult to make induction motors uh, on a miniaturized scale because of a lot of uh, uh, limitations. Okay, we have for creating these kind of structures. Okay, so next one is uh, I mean quickly going gyroscopes again. Another example, another application of uh, MEMS. Uh, you see, gyroscope is what, if, if I have a platform there, 
However, I, I take, uh, I rotate the, uh, the, the rest of it, but that platform remains the same. Okay, where is the application of this one? So for example, in mobile phones, okay. Um, yeah, so in mobile phones here, for example, uh, in, in, in games, for example here, because you are actually, uh, uh, you're actually con continuously trying to, to move something, okay. And how this movement, movement is, is, is controlled, how, how this movement is translated into, into an electronic space, that's actually because of these uh, gyroscopes, okay. Again, in space, it has tremendous applications because you have to see in which direction we are looking into. If you want to see Earth and uh, on Earth, if you want to see certain things, you have to maintain that, 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 uh, uh, that, that, that accuracy of, of seeing extremely well. And for that also, you see, from from a nail, from a from a very small uh, application to space applications, we have all these uh, technologies coming in the picture. So this is the summarization of of the of the electron beam. You see, using a simple electron beam invented in the 19th century, we have now a large number of a, a lot of uh, different different type of uh, um, uh, applications coming. In. Okay, I think I'm actually running out of time, so maybe I will. I'll, quickly go through some of these things. See, this is the electron microscope. Uh, now, why electron microscopes are there? Because we have optical microscopes with which we can actually see maximum uh, bacteria or red blood cells. Okay, there's something called the resolution limit, which is uh, called the diffraction limit. You might have learned this. If lambda is the wavelength of light, average wavelength of the light, we cannot see anything which is uh, smaller than lambda by two separated. Okay, so if two, uh, two objects are there, Separated, separated by a distance which is lambda, less than lambda by two, we cannot resolve them. We'll see them as one single object. So that is the resolution limit of uh, optical uh, microscopes. And if you want to see something further uh, in, in a smaller uh, area, what we have to do is that we have to replace light by electrons. Then we can actually see uh, things much, uh, much, much more clear. Okay, so you see this is the bacteria, um, the lactic acid bacteria. You take a little bit of uh, curd or, uh, uh, or buttermilk, and you can see this kind of uh, bacteria there. They are not very small, they are actually 800 nanometers. 800 nanometers means close to one micrometer. You can actually see in, in, a, in, a, in a microscope. Red blood cells, you can see very clearly in a, a very advanced microscope. Okay. Confocal microscopes are there, advanced optical microscopes. You can see blood uh, red cells. Okay, these are the red cells of uh, our blood. But if you want more resolution, okay, this is the maximum resolution uh, what an optical microscope can have. But I want to see the details of this red blood cell. What, what I will do, I have to use, I have to replace light by electrons, and then it is possible to see the, the blood cell. And you see something like a, um, what, what are we, a bun or, or, or uh, let's say, Chana uh, Batura, uh, something like that, because you see, this is the red blood cell, and what you see, these five small, balls in, in it, they are bacteria. So this is how bacteria um, attacks a blood cell and kills it. Okay, that's how infection comes. So you see now you, you have much more clarity, you have much more information from this, uh, from, uh, from this microscope than an optical microscope. But you see below this um, um, stem-like thing, that is the electron microscope of a human hair. Okay, human hair before you take bath. Okay, after taking bath with a good shampoo, yeah, it, it will get uh, smoothened out. You see, uh, so this is a this scalps are actually scalps of um, hair, and now it is smoothened out. Okay, a lot of research is going in the field of uh, shampoo companies. Okay, by the by shampoos. So after putting shampoo and after putting softener or um, conditioner, you can actually see in electron microscope images that there are changes in the in the structure of uh, hair. So the top hair, they will stick together. The bottom hair, they will fold like what you see in advertisements. Okay, so, so you can actually understand a lot of things about uh, how these things are. This is a cross section of a hair, human hair. And that also has a lot of things to do. If it is perfectly circular, you will have a straight ha hair. If it is slightly elliptical, you will have a curly hair. So depending upon the cross section of the hair, your nature of the hair changes. So how do we know this? Only by electron microscope. Okay. I'm quickly going, uh, this is the, what you see here is the eyes of a mosquito. Okay, I already destroyed the, the curiosity. So this is a mosquito 
and its eyes are here. You zoom it in, zoom it in, zoom it in, zoom it in, and what you see here is there is the one eye of the mosquito. So you see, its eye is a complex eye. Okay, it's not just one uh, retina like what we have. It has lenses. It's an array of lenses. It has the advantage that it can be used for three-dimensional view. Okay. It's not easy to kill a mosquito like this, right? Because it, it can actually sense the almost uh, 360 degrees. So where is its application? If you see that, okay, this is a nice idea. We can actually use an array of, array, array of uh, uh, mirrors or lenses. We can also see something in 360 degrees. Okay, may not be B, but it, it, is a, it has tremendous applications in defense, for example. Okay, where you have to see a lot of things around it at the same time. Okay, so cold virus, you can actually see under electron microscope. You see cold virus, coronavirus, they all look, uh, look the same, okay? Uh, because they are all in the same category. Um, it's beautiful images of uh, uh, viruses you can take using electron microscope. That's, uh, okay, that's uh, again, art. It is, photography is an art. If photography is an art, this is a, another type of art, okay? I think I'm um, running out of time, so, Finally, I just want to, maybe I will skip all these things. Um, how much time I have? Yeah, hello. Uh, hello? Yeah, you can have uh, five more minutes. But to please spend some time for uh, question and answer. Okay, five more minutes. So, okay, I will quickly finish. Now, um, using electrons, I, I, I said we can see a lot of things. But uh, using electrons, we cannot see everything. By, uh, so where is the limitation of our, uh, our, our C? The final thing what we can see is, is maybe atoms. Okay, so we can see atoms and not beyond that, because atoms are okay. Now it's wrapped with electrons. You see this image where nucleus is there, electrons are around it. So we can see until atoms because that is the wrap of, uh, 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 I mean, uh, uh, wrap of electrons are there. So we cannot go further into that to see. But using normal microscopes, again, we have this resolution limit, so we cannot see atoms there, for which we have to depend, depend upon quantum theory, which is uh, the, one of the most powerful theories in the, in, the, in, the, in the last century. Quantum physics we have to use. Okay, But since I don't have time, uh, I'm just uh, skipping all these things. What is quantum theory? Everything I'm, I'm skipping. Um, maybe later on, when we have time, we'll, we'll, we'll do that. Just wanted to show another art of arranging atoms. Okay, so where are where are we? This is these are exa examples of extreme arts. Okay, what I'm what I showed in, in this uh, in, in, in this particular talk is about miniaturization. Okay, art of miniaturization. So how small we can go and show that okay I can do this by art, and then what happens? Then use that art for applications. Okay. So you have seen a lot of applications already by miniaturizing things. Now the next uh, era of is again as I told you it's a, it's a, it's the era of uh, artificial intelligence. It's the era of uh, very high memory power. That means very small device structures. Everything has to be connected to each other. So which means that uh, we have to enter into a space. Feynman already um, said this uh, 40, 50 years ago that we will have to enter into a realm of research where we have to take atoms, individual atoms, and put them together, make things, okay? Make toys out of atoms, whether it is possible or not. So we have, we can actually do it and we are actually doing it in, in, in research. So there are two people, um, Henrich Rocher and Gerd Wiening in IBM Research, uh, Zurich. They discovered a wonderful microscope, which is actually called uh, a scanning tunneling microscope, okay? Details we'll, we'll, uh, we'll talk, uh, discuss later, but this is called a scanning tunnel microscope. What, what they actually do is that they have a very sharp tip, a very sharp tip coming close to a surface. And you just, if you just apply a small voltage, you see positive here, negative here, like uh, maybe half volt, 0.5 volt, one volt, like that, uh, a small voltage if you're applying. What happens is that electrons, if it is positive, what happens? This is negative. Remember our uh, electron beam, electrons will jump from negative to positive. So if your tip is so sharp that at the end you have only one atom, what happens? You can actually get electrons from every single atom. And if you map it in a three-dimensional form, okay, 
can actually see that which atoms emitted electrons, how many electrons emitted. So you can actually see the surface with uh, respect to the electrons which jumped out of the atoms. Like that, they actually they, uh, they made a small microscope there. You see how it's, it's basically like making a toy, okay, but a little advanced toy. They were actually trying to use uh, quantum principles to to do here. These electrons are jumping to the tip not by electric field. It's actually it's a, it's a process called tunneling. Um, if you have read uh, Stephen Hawking's, you will have an idea of what is tunneling. Okay. So we'll discuss that later. So this small toy, that small microscope, could take electrons out of atoms and they, then they actually image it. So they could see small bumps here. And these small bumps are nothing but atoms. So they used a silicon surface. So they could see, they could image the atoms of a silicon. And they could see some diamond shapes here, small diamond shapes. And this is actually the lower one is actually the theoretical crystal structure of a silicon. Um, it's called silicon seven by seven re reconstruction. Okay, so you see that in, in uh, um, crystallography. So this is silicon one 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 surface orientation surface. Their electron atoms are arranged like this. So they could see very vaguely but still identifiable structure of uh, uh, atom on a silicon surface. And for this discovery, they got Nobel Prize. Okay, so it's just a wonderful, wonderful discovery. It was a Nobel Prize of 1986. It was not for just taking a photo of, uh, of, of atoms. This is, to, this is for showing that art. Again, I'm using the term art. This is the art of imaging, or taking photographs of atoms. That means we can actually see the atoms. Now we are ready to play with the atoms. Okay. What type of play are we going to do with the atoms? So this is the earlier versions, of small uh, earlier ver versions of scanning tunneling microscope. This is more advanced scanning tunneling microscope. This is the image we, uh, they got from this version of uh, scanning tunneling microscope. But re uh, new versions can see atoms very clearly, very beautifully, very nicely how they are arranged. Okay, this is, these are the diamonds uh, on the silicon surface. Diamonds means the, uh, when you arrange atoms uh, like this, it will form these kind of structures. Okay, every sphere there is a uh, there, there's an, it's an atom, okay, silicon atom. Okay, shape of an atom, I, I, I don't think I, I have time here, so I'm just skipping uh, it. The shape of an atom depends upon how the oxygen at the last orbital is arranged. Okay, for example, S orbital, we know S orbital is the rounded shape, P orbital is dumbbell shape. This is, these are actual things, okay. If, if you have an atom with a P orbital uh, last electron, for example, let's, uh, let's take carbon. You might have learned that carbon has six electrons. So how they are uh, arranged? This 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. So the last electron is 2p2, that's in the p orbital. So that means, you see, whatever I give you, or whatever I have in my hand, if I wrap it with a certain shape, that is the shape of the thing, right? If I have a, uh, a chocolate, which is a bar, but I wrap it in a, uh, in a circular box. So, and I show what is the shape of this. You will say it's a, it's, it's a sphere. Just like that, if the last orbital electrons are wrapped with whatever shape of the orbital there, that is the shape of the atom. So the shape of a carbon atom is, since p orbital is at the, at, the, at the end, it will be like a dumbbell shape. Okay, all atoms are not spherical. Okay, that's, that's the important thing. So that's why we don't see, uh, sometimes, I mean, different different atoms we will see differently. For example, these uh, atoms on silicon surface, this is a STM image gallery. Okay, they have pioneered a, a scanning tunneling microscopy now, nowadays. Color is fake. There is no color for atoms, but it's just to show it's, to, it's a beautification. So you see, this is the nickel atom atoms. You see, it's like bombs. But at the same time, platinum atoms are like uh, kid leaves. Okay, so it, it, it is it's more spherical in nature. So this is a, something called holmium atom, one single atom. These are all atoms images. This is the atomic structure of graphene, graphite surface we made at IAST. We also have a small scanning tunnel microscope here. This is our microscope. You can actually see a lot of things, carbon atoms around uh, in a graphite surface, a lot of things. You make a visit to IAST, we will show you all these things there. Okay. So now what is, what is the, I'm, I'm finishing in two minutes. So what is the advantage of all these things? Okay, of, of this microscope. Now you see, seeing is, is one thing. That's okay, you can see things, you can understand a lot of things. But can you do something with it artificially? This is what, uh, again, the IBM group has done already in 1993. 
what they did is that this is a copper surface. You see the background is copper atoms, and these small beads on top they are they are iron atoms, iron. Okay, a field iron. So they just uh, put some iron atoms there at very low temperature. These are all at very low temperature. Otherwise, these atoms will not stay there. They will move around. Something called Brownian motion. Okay, so to avoid that, it is cooled down to very low temperature. So these atoms will remain there. Now, what what happens? Using this tip by applying a small voltage, they pick up one atom. They can actually put it here, pick up another one, put it here, put it here, and finally they create a um, using 48 iron atoms. They created a circle. And you see, when they completed the, that circle, there is a wave, a wave uh, structure in the in the middle. So this is a, this is a resonance wave. For example, you take a glass of water and tap on it. Okay, what, what will happen? You will get a standing wave pattern in the middle. Okay, water in a glass, you tap on it frequently. So you will get a small structure there. Like that, this is the these are the electrons on the surface of copper atoms. So this is the standing wave structure of electrons. Okay, so we have ultimate proof that um, electrons are waves. So again, people really uh, criticize sometimes saying that, okay, they have greater beautiful structures with atoms and so what, this is just art. Okay. There is no just art in, in, in science. Okay, if if it is shown, okay, this is possible. This is the starting that we can do much more uh, engineering using atoms. Okay, this is just just starting of it. So this is called the quantum coral. So yeah, just a pet name. So these are the 48 iron atoms. You see, as I told you, the structure of atoms are different for copper and iron. Iron atoms, you see, is a uh, orbitals are last orbital electrons are in a different shape. So this is the electron waves. So it's a collection of electron waves, uh, um, which is inside here. Yeah. Okay. What's the uh, application of this? You see, again, using 12 carbon monoxide molecules, people have again started making a lot of nice art, even uh, uh, images like this. But what is the advantage of what is the goal of all these things? This is not the, for just fun, because these are very difficult experiments. This is done at very low temperature, so expensive and uh, expensive experiments with a lot of um, money involved. So, is it only just art? No, it, it has also applications. Where is the application? As I told you, everything is shrinking down, and every device is actually coming into the size of individual atoms. Okay, every transistor will become nano size. Few atoms plugged together will become a transistor of future. You know. The transistor of uh, this year, it has an active length of only seven nanometer. Seven nanometer means you have nearly 15 atoms there. Okay. So that is the size of things we are talking about. How do you connect all these things together? And you need a, again, as I told you before, in the dip pen nano lithography we discussed, we need to connect them. These connections also are nanoscale. So there, we can actually use all these things. There is something called molecular scale logical circuit. Molecular electronics is coming up. So this is basically a starting of all this art of being physicist is, is actually to keep in mind that the future technologies will be opening up. Okay, so tremendous technologies are coming up in, in future. Uh, actually, uh, because of the bandwidth problem, uh, I may not be able to show this one because no. this, yeah, this you can actually see, um, all of you can actually see in, go to YouTube and see, uh, and just type a boy and his atom. You can actually see that people have IBM process group has actually my, uh, successful in manipulating atoms, atoms by atom. And this is a world record winning uh, movie because, because of the smallest actor. Okay, what is the actor? It's a single atom. It's actually a single carbon monoxide molecule. So you can actually, please go to YouTube and see later on this, uh, this movie. You can see how far we, uh, uh, scientists are successful in manipulating atoms or creating. This is again an art in itself, but it shows that we are capable of manipulating individual atoms and doing things what we want. Okay, so now we, it will open up further future. Last slide. You know these three guys: Thomas Al, um, Alva Edison, Alfred Nobel, and Albert Einstein. Okay, what is in common for this? Uh, three genius people. I mean, I have turned in the, and, and at, the, at the bottom, they have several, several, several patents. Even Einstein uh, was not very well known for his patents. But he, he was a patent officer at a patent attorney 
in, in a patent office. So he also has 50 patents. So you see, Edison was a person with a dramatic or tremendous artistic um, mind. Okay, because whatever he saw, he saw solutions there. Okay. So solutions there, applications there. So, so the thing is that when there is a uh, problem or when there is a theory coming up, when there is a new physics coming up, if you can imagine that it can be artistically, so you, you just have to view it with an artistic mind, then it comes out as applications. That, that's the essence of the entire talk I was, I was giving. If you have an artistic mind and if you have physics or chemistry, it doesn't matter, physics is just an example, physics or chemistry or whichever science uh, you have in mind, it suddenly converges into, into, into or diverges into applications. You have see one electron beam, how, how many applications are there? From a game, mobile game to space applications, there is uh, space, there is applications. Just like that, you see the imaginative power or the artistic power of the mind is actually creating. For example, 2000 patents means that mind is such a beautifully artistic mind. Or such a creative mind. I'm not saying that Einstein is not creative. He, his genius was on, on, on another side. I mean, he could imagine what people, normal people could not even imagine. What about Alfred Nobel? Alfred Nobel, we know Nobel Prize is actually the uh, the interest of, of, the, of the profit he made out of, uh, uh, out of one single molecule we, he invented. Okay. So that's uh, the trinitrotoluene TNT he discovered which was actually used in, in, in uh, wars as weapons. So he became rich like anything. And one day suddenly there was news that uh, Alfred Nobel died. That, that paper, uh, that news came in, uh, in a paper accidentally, but he was not there. He saw that news and it was written that the most dangerous man on, his, on in the history of humankind died. So and he understood that, okay, this is what people are going to say about me because I, I invented Trinitrotoluene, and now it is used uh, for war as bombs and uh, weapons. So he suddenly felt uh, very, very sorry about uh, about that, even though it was his in invention, it was used uh, wrong. Just like Einstein's uh, uh, E equal to MC, MC square was used for atom bombs. Like that, I mean, what I'm saying is that um, inventions, if you have scientific knowledge and if you have artistic mind in it, then there is suddenly coming out of uh, all kind of inventions. Okay, by that I'm actually stopping here. The take home message is not much, but every great invention has transformed our day-to-day -day life to modern life, has a great deal of art in it. Okay, I think that's clear from whatever we discussed uh, just now. This art leads to design of instruments and applications. Now, the artistic mind is the key to invention. Keep a design in mind because, uh, yes, he was not a very bright guy in, in, the, in the schools, but he had a very bright and genius mind in his own, as his own. Okay, so that's the that's the, the message here. I hope you enjoyed or um, you got some at least some information um, here. So thanks a lot for listening. Listening. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor Dinesh. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, we are running, maybe running out of time like little extent that uh, there are lots of questions also coming maybe we will collect all these questions and then send it you for answer is that a that good is, idea yeah that would be fine okay okay we, uh, over to miss marina thank you Janesh, doctor okay thank you who is a scientist with two PhD, such complex topics in science, so creatively, so was connecting it to art. Thank you, sir, for teaching them the art of becoming a physicist. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> and students, you must have seen in 1956, how five MB hard disk was carried by people to be shipped. And by 1990, in my home, we had a fourth generation PC, which had a room, removable disk. You must not have seen that to load and run a computer that was required. But now you know what you're using. But imagine in 1968, before MAM was born, 
Richard Feynman, scientist, had foreseen the nanotechnology revolution. So as Janesh doctor was uh, asking you, you must read the scientist's book, in particularly the pleasure of finding things out so that you will have this pleasure and you can, your perspective will be just, it's all art. You can connect it at all very simply and become a scientist like our speaker today. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. And all the best so, for all, all the students. So we move on to another interesting topic for the day. The topic is Earth's moon, origin, evolution, and significant discoveries from India's Chandrayaan missions. The topic, the speaker for the day is Dr. Vijay Rajesh. He's an associate professor in the Department of Earth and Space Science, IIST. About Dr. Uh, I'm, I'm certain you all are very much interested to hear the biodata of such uh, resourceful people. He got his bachelor's degree in geology from University College, Tiruvannadapura. And in master's, he's got his first rank in geology from the department, uh, from the from University of Kerala, Karivatam campus in 1999. He received his PhD degree in petrology from Yokohama National University, Japan. He worked as a postdoctoral fellow at various national universities in South Korea and Japan. And he, he's received many prestigious international fellowships from Japanese government, Ministry of Science, South Korea, Japanese Society of Promotion of Science, and so on, on, on. And he has published 30 manuscripts and lots of journals. He's actively participating in several government funded research projects. And at last, you must have heard about encyclopedias. You must have read encyclopedias, but sir has written or published two chapters in Encyclopedia of Lunar Science. Uh, and the name of the chapters are Lunar Crust Chemical Composition and Lunar Crust Morphology. Welcome, sir, to address my students. Thank you, Marina. Uh, good afternoon, all of you. So first of all, I would like to thank IEST and Sargashetra for arranging such a wonderful program for young minds okay, listening to this particular program. So for the past five days, you have been watching various lectures on space sciences and technology. Okay, so starting from our director, the register, and okay, so we have been introduced to various fields of uh, space science and technology. Okay, so you had talks on like uh, climate science, then uh, uh, physics, okay, then uh, uh, other branches of space, economics, space, life, etc. Okay, so today I'm going to uh, introduce another exciting aspect of space exploration, that is the planetary geology or planetary geoscience. Okay, so we know that like a uh, moon is a only natural satellite of our Earth, okay, and it is of the neighboring object of our Earth also. So today, using some of the fundamental concepts of geology applicable on Earth, okay, so I will try to uh, explain the various processes, okay, which led to the formation of our Earth's moon, its evolution, and also the significant findings from our own Chandrayaan missions, okay. So we had Chandrayaan 1, we had Chandrayaan 2 also, okay. So that's a, a brief outline of my talk. Now I'll share my screen. I hope you can see my screen. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So the title of my today's talk is Earth's Moon: Its Origin, Evolution, and Significant Discoveries from India's Chandrayaan Missions. Okay. So as mentioned to you previously, so I am going to introduce a new branch of uh, space exploration that is the planetary geoscience or the planetary geology. Hope all of you know about geology. So this mainly deals with the study of rock formation, mineral formation, then internal structure of our earth. Okay, so various other processes like volcanism, tectonics, etc. 
okay so and using those concepts okay so we can try to understand the formation of our uh, terrestrial planets then some of the satellites of terrestrial planets and the jovian planets also okay so uh, using this particular branch like we can have like lot of evidences for the presence of past life on mars i am just saying evidences it doesn't mean that life is confirmed in the case of mars okay so we can also use this branch to understand the habitable environments on other planets also okay the areas of interest are like we will be looking for the surface features then various minerals present over moon mars or other terrestrial planets then interior structure tectonic aspects planetary volcanism and it has lot of applications on astrobiology also which is one among the emerging field in planetary sciences okay so now let us go to the moon okay so today i am going to discuss about have you ever thought of like how our moon has been formed okay so on a bright night sky you can see full moon and you can see like a lot of features like this here you can notice that two different views of moon are there you can also notice that there are like brighter and darker regions are there lot of impact craters are there okay then a uh, significant finding of water on moon and india's contributions to lunar science i'll come back to this diagram later okay because initially i want to introduce some fundamental concepts of geology now we all know that yesterday dr jagdeep also mentioned about like various planets and various other bodies in our universe okay? so if you are taking our solar system we have two groups of planets of course there is another group also that is the dwarf planets okay so broadly we can group them into terrestrial and jovian planets okay the terrestrial planets they are known as the earth like planets and they are close to our sun okay it is also known as rocky planets because it is mainly made up of uh, silicates metals etc okay then in the case of jovian planets they are jupiter like planets and they are far from sun because of that it is known as the outer planets they are made up of like uh, uh, gaseous phases and icy materials also so here the ice means it is not only really water ice you can have ice of varying composition of these planets okay so one of the way to understand what a planet is made up of okay so we can see the density of these planets so if you are taking the terrestrial planets so you can uh, notice that the density of terrestrial planets are quite high okay when compared to the jovian planets if you look at the density of saturn it is approximately 0.69 g per cm3 so this indicates that like uh, these are made up of extremely light of materials okay so if you are taking that the jovian planets only towards its core part it has some metallic components okay but if you are taking the terrestrial planets you can notice that okay they are having higher density okay. it indicates that it is made up of like uh, dense materials like silicates then metallic phases are there etc and our moon is having a density of 3.3 g per cm3 now uh you know that at the uh, initial stages of a planet formation okay so it's a hot molten body so at that time like a lot of heat sources were there to keep the planet as a hot molten body so let us discuss about the various heat sources so those input the accretion that is at the time of the formation of the planet that is that many materials keep coalesced it leads to the formation of a planet okay so that is known as the accretionary heat then impact okay so immediately after the formation of a planet it was continuously especially towards the earlier stages of the solar system evolution it was continuously bombarded with like a lot of impactors so it also generated a heat to the planet then with the process of time what will happen the planets will separate or segregate into different regions like crust mantle and core so that particular process is known as differentiation and it can also impart the heat if you are having radioactive heat producing elements like uranium and thorium okay so radioactive decay will take place and that can also give provide heat to a particular planet so these are all the various sources of heat with course of time what will happen the planet will cool off so same as the various heat sources there are various ways in which a planet can cool off also which include convection which take place in a microscopic level and convection okay which is in a macroscopic level and eruptions also okay so eruption means towards the deeper part it will be hot once that hot magma comes out what will happen that towards that deeper part that much volume of heat will be released it will cool off okay and outside we will have formation of volcano etc 
Then another important aspect is that if the planet is large, it will take a longer time to cool off. Let us take uh, the example of our Earth and say Mars or Moon. Okay, so Earth still we are having approximately 20 percentage of internal heat remaining. Okay, so that's why we are having processes like earthquakes, volcanism, plate tectonics, etc. But if you are taking Moon or Mars, we are not hearing anything about that recent volcanic activity. So that is mainly due to the role of internal heat. So in the case of Moon, Mars, since it's a smaller body, there is no more internal heat remaining. Okay, so that is the concept over here. Now. The case of our Earth, like it is also layered structure, so it has a crust, okay, so it has a mantle, then it is having a core also. The nature of our Earth's core, the inner core is liquid. Sorry, we have two different layers of our core, okay, so we have a liquid core and we have that inner core which is uh, solid in nature. Then another important aspect is here, we have a lithosphere that is the solid component of our Earth. And below that, we are having asthenosphere. It actually forms the part of the mantle also, part of the lithosphere. And the asthenosphere, remaining part of this mesosphere, it forms the mantle part. Okay, so asthenosphere is plastically molten, and the lithosphere, which is a solid body, lying above the asthenosphere. Okay, so if any heat is receiving to asthenosphere from deeper region, what will happen? Since it is a plastic or partially molten region, it can trigger the movement of lithosphere. So the lithosphere is known as our plates. Okay, The plates are otherwise known as lithosphere. And if the lithosphere is moving, what will happen? We will have plate motions or plate movements. Though the plates can come close to each other, the plates can divert or go away from each other, or we can have sideways type of movements also. So depending upon different types of plate movements, we can have different types of geological process also. So the most important aspect here is that the, we have a layered structure like crust, mantle, and core. Now, we are calling the terrestrial planets as Earth-like structures, okay? So you can notice that like uh, the Earth is having a layered structure. So if you are taking Venus, Mars, Mercury, and Moon, okay, you can notice a similar type of structure is there. So you look at the uh, density, hope you remember the density value of Earth and Mercury. They are more or less same. Earth is having slightly higher value. What is the reason for that? Look at the Mercury. The so core is approximately 75% of the internal structure of Mercury is occupied by its core, which is made up of iron and nickel. Okay, the crust and mantle part is smaller. Because of that, its density is quite high, more or less comparable to our Earth's density also. The, here, another important aspect is that the core is made up of heavier metals like iron, nickel, with some amount of sulfur. If you are moving towards the mantle, again, it is made up of elements like iron, magnesium, with the minor amounts of nickel. And if you are moving towards the crustal part, it is entirely made up of lighter materials. Okay, so that is the compositional variation between the crust, mantle, and core. So, applying what we have learned about our Earth's interior, we can use those concepts to understand the geological processes, origin, evolution, etc., of all other planets. Now, after the formation of planets, we discussed about the various heat sources and cooling took place. And once that uh, internal heat is not there, what will happen? We will not have volcanism or tectonics. Okay, so there are various processes. Sorry. There are various processes which can shape up the planetary surface after its formation. So broadly, we can group those processes into exogenic and endogenic processes. So exogenic means the processes are externally uh, derived or externally triggered. Endogenic means that internally derived processes. So here we have volcanism and tectonics as that internally derived processes and the impact cratering and erosion. And erosional activities like by water, wind and ice. Okay, so they can act as uh, exogenic processes. Though I mentioned here as erosional activities, it includes like a weathering, erosion, transportation, and deposition. So in the case of our Earth, we have a very thick atmosphere, and we have agents like water, wind, and ice are there. They will continuously come and interact with our Earth's surface. Modification will take place. Okay, So because of that, our Earth's surface is always younger when compared to Moon or Mars. Okay, So these are the various processes. Now, before going further, we should have some idea about what are the various minerals and rocks. 
of course it is uh, difficult because a lot of minerals are there so we are uh, today's talk we are taking three uh, minerals like uh, olivine pyroxene okay so uh, now onwards like i will use those minerals as magnesium and iron bearing minerals and for lunar purpose okay so i need this particular mineral also that is the calcium aluminium rich mineral okay so you can see the color of these three minerals okay olivine and pyroxene they are made up of magnesium iron okay so because of that they are having darker color and they are denser also now coming to feldspar it is made up of calcium aluminium silicate okay because of that it is lighter in color and it is less dense okay or it is lighter okay. now so we have two groups of minerals like mafic which means that magnesium iron and calcium dominated which is always darker in color then felsic we have like silica aluminium sodium and potassium dominated when these minerals combine we will have formation of rocks okay so n number of rocks are there we are not going into details of that one another important aspect is here like a lot of experimental studies have conducted to understand the formation of various minerals okay so of which like we are today going to discuss about these two minerals like olivine and a co crystallization of calcium rich mineral also okay so this is of lighter in nature or less dense and these are of heavier dense so please keep these things in your mind because it is useful to understand the geology of our earth's moon okay so now let us see how the plate tectonic processes are operating on our earth right? okay so you can see that heat is coming from deeper side what is happening like here it is coming and interacting with the lithosphere movement of that lithospheric plates are taking place okay so here what is happening the plates are diverging and here the plates are converging two plates collide and one plate is going towards the deeper side okay the plate which is going to the deeper side what will happen it is going to a region having high pressure and high temperature region so it will again melt and it will come out in the formation of come out as volcanoes okay see here here the densest place is going towards the deeper side okay and it is reaching up to a region of high pressure and high temperature condition melting is taking place here okay so once melting is taking place what will happen melt won't reside there it will try to come out in the form of volcanoes okay see okay so these are the ways in which the formation of our filipina japanese island etc has been formed okay so this is the plate tectonic concept you can see our earth's moon also here okay but in the case of other planets we consider it as a single plate body okay so these type of plate tectonic processes were not operated on other planets but intra plate or internal plate processes were there that is why like volcanism or mars so volcanism tectonics etc were there towards the earlier stages of these plants okay now coming to tectonics we can have like a compression type of tectonics and extension type of tectonics are also there so if you have compression or collision type of tectonics we can have formation of folded mountain chains the best example is our himalayas okay now if extension type of tectonic settings are there what will happen we can have formation of depression type of features they are known as the valleys okay so now in the case of moon like uh, the role of say water then wind ice are minimum so i am not going to discuss in details of that one but if you are going towards the mars the wind and ice activities are still taking place on mars okay so these can cause erosional activities and continuous modifications to the surface can take place due to wind water and ice okay now another important aspect as i told you previously immediately after the formation of planet what will happen it will be continuously bombarded with impact craters so impact craters has a significant role in shaping up of the planetary surface so let us see one animation here see impact craters hit the planetary surface excavation took place okay so what is happening the material from deeper side came to this particular region okay so we have like a two types of impact craters are there a simple crater which means that a simple bowl shaped structure is there then a complex crater is there here a sort of rebound mechanism will take place that is the material from deeper side will come and occupy as a central peak okay so you can notice a mound or peak type of feature towards the center part of that particular crater okay so that's the difference between a simple crater and a complex crater so it depends upon the nature of impactor and how much resistance offered by that planetary surface or crust to that impactor 
Okay, so you can notice these two type of features. Now I will let you know what are the significance of these impact craters. So impact craters, even though we consider it as a destructive processes, in the case of planetary geology, we have a lot of advantages are there. So this is the Barrington crater in Arizona. Okay, so you can notice the surface over here and you can notice that impact crater also. See, what are the features you can observe over here? If you're looking at this particular region, we cannot see the deeper part of a particular planet or particular body. But if impact craters are there, it will expose the deeper part. Hello. Yeah. So if you, yeah. So if, yeah. Hello. Any issue? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah, it's clear. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So uh, if impact crater is not there, like we will not get any idea about the deeper part of a planet. Okay. So if impact craters are there, it ex actually exposes the deeper part so that we will get some idea about the nature of materials, composition of the materials present towards the deeper side of a planet. Okay. Now, uh, this is one impact crater present on Mars. Okay. You can notice that a central peak is there. It is actually the material from the deeper side. Okay. And here you can notice some type of features like a splashing type of effect is there. So we will have these type of features only if the surface is having water or if you are having subsurface ice. So this is one among the critical evidence to say that once upon a time water was present on Mars. Okay. So you can notice that towards the rim or towards the surrounding region of this particular crater. Okay. A splashing type of features are so there. And See, craters are also important to understand the relative age dating of the planet that I will show you in the next slide. Okay, I'll show you one video here, okay, to show that how these type of splashing effects are formed, okay. Assume that we are throwing a stone in a muddy surface, what will happen? Okay, let us see that in this particular video, okay. See, this is a muddy surface and we are throwing stone over here. See the splashing effect is there, okay? So same type of features we can observe here and based on these type of features, scientists conclude that once upon a time, water was there on this particular region of Mars. Very good evidence for the presence of fast water on Mars, okay? Now, another important aspect of impact craters are there. They can be used to understand relative age of a particular planet. Let us take example of our older roads and younger smooth roads. See the conditions of the older roads. We can see that large number of gutters or potholes are there in these older roads and the younger roads. Okay, so we know that this is like a relatively new, newly laid road. Okay, and here these are the old roads with large number of craters. Again, the same concept we can apply over here also. Okay. Yeah, the same crater, uh, the same feature we can apply on the moon or any other terrestrial planets also. What is happening here? This is one region of moon having large number of craters are there and here you can notice that like uh, very few craters are there so we can say that this particular region is older and where the region which is having less number of craters they are younger so here you can notice that large number of craters are there we can clearly say that this particular region is older nature the same concept we can apply to mars moon venus mercury etc but in the case of Earth, what happened? That continuous modification is there. Again, because of that, we are having like a less number of craters preserved. And we can say that that surface is younger. Okay, So that is the concept of relative age dating technique using the uh, impact craters. Okay, So now I'm not going into the details of the fundamental concepts of Earth and Moon because I already it be aware of the fundamental features. The most important aspects here is the Earth, which is having a very thick atmosphere, strong atmospheric agents are there. It will just continuously come and interact with the Earth's surface. Modifications will take place. In the case of Moon, there is a, the first answer will be no atmosphere, but there is a very thin atmosphere on Moon, but it does not have much role on the superficial processes of Moon. Okay, and also there is no liquid water on the moon, but uh, there are reports of ice at the polar regions in the permanently shadowed regions of the moon. We will come back to this aspect later. Now, what are the ways in which like we can study our Earth's moon? The most important tool is remote sensing. Okay, so most of our data came from that orbital remote sensing by various missions like NASA, ESA, ISRO. Then a lot of other space agencies are now trying to uh, 
go to moon mars etc okay then if you are having samples from moon like especially in the case of moon like the returned mission sample were there so we got the in situ samples from moon as you know got apollo missions and luna missions okay they actually got like a few samples from a particular regions of moon we can study those samples and have our own interpretation based on our results then we can also see some of the regions of our earth which is similar to say moon or mars okay so we can study those regions in detail and extrapolate our results to understand the processes operated on other planets also so that particular branch is terrestrial analog study okay so if time permits i will show you one or two examples of this terrestrial analog research also so another important way in which we can study our earth's moon is through the available meteorites okay some of the meteorites that came to earth is from the highland regions of our moon okay so through studying those meteorites also we can understand some of the uh, features of some aspects okay so these are the various ways in which we can study our earth's moon okay now coming back to moon okay so now you know what are the the fundamental concepts okay so using those concepts like especially using that minerals and rocks we are trying to understand the geological process of moon so you have two different views of moon so one is known as that near side view the other one it is known as the far side view of moon from our earth we can always see this view okay so that is why it is known as the near side view and the far side it is not possible for us to see through our naked eye or to earth okay the reason is due to that the tidal locking effect or that the synchronous rotation of earth and moon okay so what are the features of moon which we can observe you can notice that there are some brighter regions are there okay then large number of craters are there okay you can notice here here okay here also towards the far side also we can notice that large number of craters okay but what are the main differences between that near side and far side okay so you can notice that towards the far side there are very few darker regions are there okay but towards the near side large number of darker regions are there then if you are taking that impact craters you can notice that towards the far side you are having large number of impact craters are there when compared to the far side we are having less number of impact craters towards the near side one more aspect is there that is the crustal thickness using geophysical criteria scientists have measured the crustal thickness of both near side and far side region okay the crustal thickness of near side region is approximately 55 to 60 km and towards the far side it is say approximately 100 km so this particular features that is that variation in impact craters variation in that darker regions okay the i mentioned it as mary region so i will come to back to it later okay then variation in the crustal thickness so this particular concept is known as the crustal asymmetry of our earth's moon okay. hope the concept is clear to all of you so already i have uh, explained this one like we can only see this particular view of our moon from earth okay the moon rotates in 27.3 days and moon orbits also in 27.3 days so because of that moon rotates and revolves at the same rate we can only see this one side so that is known as the synchronous rotation so sometimes people have used the other side as the darker side especially the far side as the darker side it is not like that there is no darker side it is known as the far side of moon okay so near side and far side okay. now coming to origin of our earth's moon okay so there are various theories and models available for the formation of our earth's moon which include fission capture accretion then giant impact hypothesis and sometimes back another concept came that is two moons like okay because uh, the near side and far side is having like a different features so some of the scientists consider that two moons were there they came and accreted okay but uh, it didn't get much momentum because we need uh, other evidences to support those type of hypothesis so i am not going to details of uh, this one fissure capture accretion etc i will just mention about the giant impact hypothesis because this is the most widely accepted hypothesis or theory to explain the formation of our earth's moon okay so this theory says that the proto earth that is known as the gaia okay so it was hit by a mars sized object known as theia okay so what happened it hit our early earth gaia and uh, the part of our earth's crust okay man even earth was also towards its uh, solidification stage it means that only core has developed core has slightly developed and the mantle and crust are still molten in nature so that mars is object came and hit the surface of earth right okay so what happened after that lot of debris were there 
okay so later those debris got accumulated or coalesced okay and then brought to the gravitational field of our earth okay so that is the way in which moon has been formed okay so this is the most widely accepted concept i'll show you one video regarding the formation of our earth's moon see okay a mars size object came hit debris has been formed finally they got accumulated okay accreted and brought to the gravitational field of our earth okay so now the moon has been formed and especially the giant impact hypothesis it could explain some of the critical aspects of earth moon relations okay so that's why like a majority of the scientists consider that this as the viable mechanism for the formation of our earth's moon so it could explain the earth's spin and the luna the moon's orbit it is having the similar orientation then uh we have some samples by apollo missions and also as a meteorite collection so okay so i just studied that one and uh, noticed that once upon a time it was molten and had some similarities with earth also then uh, another important evidence came from the stable isotopic ratios especially the oxygen isotope ratios of the lunar and terrestrial samples okay so yeah, more or less same but uh, the simulated oxygen isotope ratios of other planets are not matching because of these aspects scientists consider the giant impact hypothesis as the most viable mechanism for the formation of our earth moon okay so now we are going to discuss about some of the features especially how those brighter regions are formed darker regions are formed okay then how what is the role of impact craters on moon okay now uh, as i mentioned previously the moon has sorry no atmosphere or a very thin atmosphere was there what are the advantages so it will help us to see the surface of moon with fine details okay you can notice that from your childhood onwards you might be looking for moon okay you can notice that there won't be much change okay and because no atmosphere is there we can clearly see the moon also okay but in the case of earth what is happening if today if rain is taking place what will happen the surface which we are seeing today is not the same surface which we are going to see tomorrow okay so this is the case now no weathering of the surface by water or storm but the continuous interaction with solar flares is there because of that space weathering effects will be there then uh, since no atmosphere is there there is no protection from high energy solar particles or cosmic rays are there and there is no plate tectonics also there so these are some of the fundamental concepts then we can compare the geological features of like earth and moon so earth as i mentioned it is geologically active the surface is continuously modified because of that it's a younger surface then in the case of moon it is geologically inactive so this inactive means it is with respect to endogenic processes because there is no uh, recent evidence for volcanism and tectonics on moon okay and we have the older surface also because what surface formed during the 4.5 billion years still we can see that surface on moon but in the case of earth that is not possible because the earlier surface been modified continuously by plate tectonic activities and also through interaction with the earth's atmosphere okay so uh, in the case of earth we are having plate tectonics so that like uh, plate movements will take place modifications etc will take place but in the case of moon it is a smaller body it pulls fast okay then no convection type of heat sources are there and no pore of hot molten material is also there okay. now i'll show you one video this is actually a video from lrc that is lunar reconnaissance orbiter camera of nasa's lro mission lro is lunar reconnaissance orbiter mission okay so in this video it shows the various geological features of various superficial features of our earth's moon see this is the near side you can notice that large amount of darker materials are there towards the near side and you can notice that far side region see large number of craters are there and very less darker regions are there towards the far side region okay and some of the craters are darker but you can notice that some of the craters have brighter features surrounding it we will discuss why it is so okay so you can notice that some craters are darker in nature some are showing that brighter features over there okay yeah. now coming to the various features of our earth moon okay see this is the highland region or the brighter regions of our moon is known as the highland or highly elevated regions of our earth's moon actually this crust is the first formed crust of the earth's moon okay formed from 4.5 to 4.3 billion years that is immediately after the formation of our earth's moon and it continued up to say 4.3 billion years okay so this is the was the first crust formed on moon 
why it is brighter in appearance in satellite imagery and while looking through our naked eye or telescope because it is entirely made up of a rock known as anorthosite okay which is made up of calcium and aluminium since there is no iron or magnesium present in this particular rock okay it appears like brighter and these are that highly elevated regions of our moon now these darker regions they are younger features formed between 3.9 to 1 billion years okay so they are known as the ma maric regions okay the darker regions of our moon why it is dark because it is having a higher proportion of iron and magnesium okay so the particular rock type is known as basalt basalt is a common rock on earth also if you are going to deccan tracks or deccan plateau okay so we can see this particular rock in abundant okay so it is a basalt which is entirely made up of iron and magnesium so that is the first difference the brighter regions and the darker regions brighter regions they are younger the darker regions are older regions of our earth moon okay then there are some other features like impact craters so some of the impact craters they are darker in appearance some of the impact craters they are brighter also okay so two more features are there that are known as the rays and rills okay so that we will discuss in few moments okay now let us discuss how these brighter regions of moon are formed okay so immediately after the formation of our earth's moon it was also hot molten in nature so hot molten means it has like a lot of magma was there with the course of time what will happen crystallization will take place and we have formation of three minerals or crystals like olivine and pyroxene which is made up of iron and magnesium and anorthite or the plagio clays which is having calcium aluminum what will happen in that particular magma chamber since the olivine and pyroxene is having a higher proportion of iron and magnesium it moved towards the bottom of moon or uh, say the bottom of the magma chamber and the calcium aluminum rich mineral which is lighter it floated towards the top okay so continuous accumulation of that brighter material so calcium aluminum rich material has given rise to the brighter crust or a thick anorthosite crust of our moon okay and this is the older crust at this particular time there was no darker regions on our moon so we can simply say that the crustal part of our earth's moon is composed of calcium aluminum rich minerals and the rock is known as anorthosite and towards the mantle part it is rich in iron and magnesium okay clear so this is the case during 4.5 billion years immediately after the formation of our moon now that crust has been formed our scenario is that crust is composed of anorthosite then it after the formation it was continuously bombarded by meteorites asteroids etc and towards the mantle part we are having iron and magnesium rich region sir there now so towards the earlier stages lot of heat producing agents were there even though it is composed of iron and magnesium what will happen if heat sources are available it can partially melt total melting will not take place it can partially melt some of the regions inside the moon what will happen the iron and magnesium bearing rocks will melt you have formation of a partial molten materials towards the deeper side so keep this thing in your mind we will explain it later in the next slide okay now this is the original anorthositic highland crust of moon which is formed from 4.5 to 4.3 billion years old what is the nature of this crust you can notice that it is highly rugged in nature it is not at all smooth of in appearance okay after its formation it has continuously been bombarded by meteoritic impacts and because of some tectonic activities also it appears like highly elevated or highly rugged in appearance i'll show you one video regarding the uh, nature of an orthosetic crust see okay you can notice that undulated type of topography are there Okay, see, large number of craters are present in the anorthositic highland regions also. This is a far side, entirely composed of anorthosite with the less darker materials, and this is the near side. Okay. Okay. Now let us see, like how these darker regions of our Earth's moon are formed. Okay, so. you can notice that like uh, this is the anorthositic crust and it was continuously bombarded by meteorite what will happen i'll show you one video and after that we can come back to this particular slide see here you should listen we will be explaining like what are the role of impact craters in this particular video okay see this is the meteorite or external impactor and we have that lunar surface over here 
okay and what is the nature of this particular surface it is anorthosetic in nature okay see okay so the impact crater has been formed over here okay and this is known as the primary crater because it is formed due to external impactor and what happened to the materials over here so lot of ejecta materials were there okay they have flew on the surface and once it loses its velocity what will happen it will come and hit the surface of moon itself so that we will have formation of that secondary impact craters up there okay see these are secondary impact craters okay now you can notice that there is one shadow region and the brighter regions are there this shadow region it is because this is the less illuminated region or a no illumination region of our earth's moon especially towards the inner part of that crater okay you should remember this one we will use this especially in the case of water on moon okay so impact craters are important we can understand the deeper part of our earth's moon see these are the deeper regions of our earth's moon okay so if impact craters are there it is easy for us to understand the internal structure then see previously i mentioned that there are rays are there you can notice that some of the craters over here they are like uh, darker in appearance and some of the craters you can notice that brighter features are there so this is not due to compositional aspect this is due to albedo effect okay so if you are having that brighter region surrounding a crater we can say that this particular crater is younger when compared to those darker craters because with course of time what will happen this will continuously interact with the solar flares and only that freshness will go okay so this will also change to darker region darker features like now you can notice that like uh, brighter features are there which indicates that these are younger craters okay so these type of craters are known as the rayed craters okay so here you can notice that this is a older crater because no brighter features are there okay but here you can notice that those are younger craters because brighter features are there okay we can also see the similar type of features if you are looking moon through our naked eyes also okay now see these are the migration of materials taking place on moon through the crater walls okay see now most important aspect we are going to discuss about how those darker regions of our earth's moon is formed so here this is the anorthosetic surface or anorthosetic crust towards the deeper region we have that basaltic partially molten material are there what will be the composition of this particular melt since it is formed due to the melting of iron and magnesium bearing materials okay what happened this is of darker material this is entirely composed of iron and magnesium now let us see what is the role of impact crater it will come hit the planetary surface it will create lot of shock waves in the form of fracture patterns these fracture patterns if it is reaching to that partially molten zone what will happen already after its formation this melt might be looking for an avenue to come towards the top but if it is getting a fracture through that impact cratering process what will happen this melt or magma will come through this fracture and occupy the region okay see the impactors are coming and hitting the surface anorthosetic crust okay now you can notice that the all these craters will be occupied by that molten material see okay so this is the way in which the darker regions of our earth's moon has been formed and you look at the nature of this particular surface in the case of anorthosetic crust you can notice that it's a sort of undulated surface but here this is a sort of smooth surface is there so especially if you are looking at the darker regions they are relatively smoother when compared to that anorthosetic highland region then if you are uh, looking uh, taking the aspect of crater counting we can notice that the highland or that anorthosetic regions are formed during the earlier stages and the mary regions they are formed towards the younger stages okay so now moving towards that uh, some of the other aspect 
uh, using the Chandrayaan 1 mission, there is one payload by NASA that, that is Moon Mineralogy Mapper. It gave a full coverage of the various minerals or elements present in the lunar surface. Okay, so you can notice that these are the green, purple, and the blue areas. They are the iron rich lava flows. Okay, so these are the Mary regions, and that red and pink regions, they are the anorthocytic island crust of the moon. So it gives a very good uh, like a uh, differentiation between that anorthosite and the Mary regions. Okay, so now let us see how the data can be acquired from moon. Okay, so all these videos can prepared based on that Chandrayaan one data. Okay, since uh, lack of time is there, I'm going to quickly. Okay, see the satellite or the payload, they're probing the lunar surface. Okay, so depending upon that emission, absorption and the reflection properties of the surficial materials, we will get the data. So here I'm showing you that one hyperspectral image present in the Chandrayaan 1. So it is having 80 meter resolution, uh, 64 bands, spectral bands were there. Okay, so it is continuously probing the lunar surface. Okay, see. Okay, see, based on the dark reflection, absorption, and its property. Okay, so data will be recorded. Okay, so each rock or each elements will have different properties. So finally, the data will be transmitted to the Earth station. Okay, so processing can take place. We can apply suitable correction mechanism, and we will get a meaningful patterns like this. Okay, so we can uh, just like iron, calcium, aluminum, etc., so that we can understand what are the particular materials present in that region. Okay, so this is the way in which data has been accessed. Now, uh, if you're going towards the moon, okay, the first material on the surface is that lunar regolith. Okay, so regolith is simply we can say that it's the soil present on lunar surface. They are formed due to impact cratering processes. Okay, so in the case of our Earth, the soil is formed by weathering process, but in the case of moon, okay, so they are formed due to impact cratering processes, okay? This regolith is also very much important because they will continuously interact with solar flares, okay? So it can act as a good repository for some of that uh, elements like helium, et cetera. So this is the rays which already I have discussed. Now, let us see about that land, various landing missions towards some moon. You know that uh, like Apollo missions are there, okay? Surveyor missions are there, Luna missions are there. So in this particular map, you can notice that which region it has landed. See, this is the highland region and this is the Mary region. Okay, you can notice that almost all the landings took place in the Mary region only. What is the reason for that? Because the Mary region, that rover wheel movement is relatively easy when compared to highland region, because highland region is a relatively uh, rough in nature and the Mary region is like uh, smoother in appearance. Okay, so that's why almost all missions, Apollo missions landed over here. And that, that is the limitation also because it landed in a limited area and the samples were collected from this limited area only. So our understanding based on the samples is very limited and majority of the data came from that orbital remote sensor. Okay, is that clear? Now, this is the Changi, the three China's mission, but China has advanced. It has actually, the Changi four mission, it has actually landed on the far side of the moon, far side island region of moon. And that is the first mission from any space agencies landing on the far side of the moon. Now, I'll show you one video, like uh, what are the geological aspects, okay? So required to choose a particular landing site, let's see. So on a particular grid cell, okay, let us see. First, topography will be considered, okay? Or a topographical mapping will take place. So we should understand like what are the geological features present in that particular region. Then uh, we will look for a leveled surface, okay? Because that it will accelerate or help us in that rover field movement, okay? Then temperature of the surface is also important. Okay. Then hazards, okay? So we can monitor or map the small rock hazards or major uh, mega hazards also, like, okay? Surface imaging can take place. And finally, see that the large rock hazards are there. Okay, so considering all these aspects, like scientists can fix like a, which is a suitable area for landing. You can notice that based on all these aspects, scientists have fixed that 
this green region is or green shaded region is suitable for a planting okay so this is a geological criteria of course there are other criteria also but uh, the geological criteria okay so now let us see some of the samples brought by apollo missions okay you can notice that the anorthosite okay some which are like a brighter in appearance okay but it is sticked with that mary material is also there and this is the mary basalt you can notice that lot of gish uh, pits are there okay so that can be either due to escapement of gaseous phases or due to impact by micro meteorites okay then some class are also there these are like a representative samples from apollo probe missions so these are the important features of our earth moon okay so now i will quickly go through our uh, important missions okay so we had chandrayaan 1 mission and the chandrayaan 2 mission also so the chandrayaan 1 mission which is our first indian planetary mission to moon which has been launched on 22nd october okay so it has a payloads from india and the payloads from various other space agencies are so there so the important aspects it uh, tried to understand the key questions on lunar geology or lunar science like uh, origin of moon understanding the early history and the evolution then what are the various resources available on our earth's moon okay so lot of payloads were there in that one okay then uh, what are the significant scientific achievements probably you might have read that the significant achievement from the chandrayaan 1 mission is the finding of water actually that is the significant achievement from our chandrayaan 1 mission then it has also identified some of the new minerals on moon or new rocks like magnesium aluminum spinel bearing rocks okay then uh, some complex craters has been identified and detected then dome type of volcanoes has been identified and also the important detection of water polar ice i'll quickly go through what are the various payloads present in the chandrayaan 1 okay so i'm not going to all these payloads like uh, so here you can notice that tmc that is terrain mapping camera to map the lunar surface then high c that is hyperspectral imager that is to understand the various minerals and volatiles present in the lunar surface then mq is actually the moon mineralogy mapper you have seen one image from that mq okay then moon impact probe is also there then minisa etc okay so we are going to discuss about some of the results from mq tmc and high c okay so 11 scientific yeah, instruments were present there okay now before going to that significant finding of water on moon how where and why water are there okay so there are two different sources of water which includes that exogenic sources and endogenic sources okay so i am not going to the details of endogenic sources because this is also endogenic source of water has also been confirmed by our chandrayaan 1 mission okay so we can focus on that exogenic sources so what are those materials those are the lunar ice present in the permanently shadowed regions of our moon okay and why it is preserved it is because of that poor illumination condition so we will discuss this aspect with bit detail so okay so what are the i'm sorry i'm going a little bit quickly okay so what are the various possible sources of our polar tides okay so it includes the solar wind the moon itself i will explain this later okay then giant molecular clouds interplanetary dust particles are there asteroids comets etc it will come and hit the surface of our earth's moon okay now this is one m cube map for the water molecules present on the moon you can notice that towards the polar side northern and southern poles blue colored regions are there so those blue colored regions are indicative of the presence of water molecules okay especially you can notice that that polar regions both southern and northern poles have higher abundance of water okay so water ice has been identified from this region now how they have identified okay so let us again come back to the crater so this is one crater that is the shoemaker crater okay so you can notice that another crater that is the shackleton crater and uh this is another crater that is erlanger so here you can notice that only a with less area is illuminated okay towards the floor region or towards the internal region it is less illuminated so what will happen towards the earlier stage if comets or like uh, say water bearing asteroids etc it came and deposited water ice on these regions like it will be permanently preserved over there because sunlight won't reach there melting will not take place it can be preserved as such Uh, with some modifications that is if uh, like a uh, micro meteorite impactors are there some modifications will take place towards this particular region okay so let us this is one example okay in whichever angle the sun is there the uh, floor and towards the internal part of this 
crater won't receive the sunlight only the rim part will receive the sunlight okay so recently our scientists have mapped the permanently shadowed regions on our earth's moon okay so they have noticed like uh, you can notice that these are the permanently shadowed craters on our earth's moon like why it is known as permanently shadowed because light won't reach there and it is also uh, difficult to get maximum data from these particular regions also so in future missions scientists are focusing more to explore these particular regions they will artificially impart light from the satellites or payload and try to measure some of the features of this particular region okay so it has lot of implications on lunar science so you can notice that only the rims of that deep craters are slightly illuminated but towards the deeper region it is not illuminated so then these permanently shadowed crater first they have mapped the permanently shadowed crater then the temperature mapping has been done and you can notice that towards the permanently shadowed region so this is the like 40 to 110 kelvin okay the lowest temperature reported from the maximum bodies in the solar system see this is the temperature range towards the permanently shadowed region so you can imagine how cold these regions are there so this is one crater known as the shackleton crater so this is also a permanently shadowed crater hope some of you are aware about the nasa's future mission that is the artemis mission it is going to land some of the smaller regions surrounding this shackleton crater okay so let us see to uh, go to the details of the shackleton crater see what are the features you can observe here the shackleton crater the dimension is approximately 21 km versus 4.2 km deep and only some part of the shackleton crater is illuminated okay so if whole water ice has been deposited up to this depth okay say up to 4.2 km imagine about the quantity of water available in one particular permanently shadowed crater okay let us have a size comparison of shackleton crater with our grand canyon okay so this is the size comparison now if we can map that a whole permanently shadowed region look for that water ice present in all these regions and just consider that enough quantity of that exogenic water or water ice is present on moon like so next scientific aspect is how uh, well we can tap those water ice and utilize for our missions and if we are thinking about the habitable conditions or habitable environments how we can perfectly use that one okay so considering that overall availability of water on moon water budgeting can be done and we can also think of constructive use of water ice okay now so this is uh, the case of like external agents like icy comets etc might have come and deposited water ice on this permanently shadowed region so another source is that like uh, the water formed from the lunar surface itself what will happen the solar flares are continuously coming and hitting the lunar surface okay the h plus ions it will come and interact with various minerals present in the uh, lunar surface what will happen that h plus interacts with the, the oxygen of the silicate minerals and that reaction dissociation reactions will take place h plus will react with the oxygen you will have formation of water the concept is that like uh, the water will form in the equatorial region and after the formation it will try to migrate towards the polar region the exact reason okay so why it is forming towards the equatorial region and then migration taking to the polar region still research are going on in that direction so this is another source for the presence of water on mars so here h plus ions interact with the surficial minerals on the uh, on moon then what will happen like water will be formed and it will migrate to the permanently shadowed craters present towards the polar regions okay so this is another source now i mentioned about the endogenic source endogenic source means like some of the water present with the primary minerals i am going I'm not going to the details of that one but that is also the significant finding from our indian planetary scientists okay so you can notice that like uh, see indian research teams find endogenous water on moon like it came in current science and later lot of studies are taking place on this presence of endogenic water also so the credit also goes to the chandrayaan 1 mission okay see this is actually another image from mars actually so till now we discussed about the water on moon now water is also an important parameter on mars also see at 4. Point, 4 billion years you are having lot of evidences for water on mars okay but now there are very few water present on mars but recent data from some of the impact craters on mars scientists consider that purely 
water ice has been uh, identified from coral reef crater and using like a, a surface penetrating radars okay they have identified some water below the subsurface of mars also so it means that water is an important parameter in the case of moon in the case of mars etc and also if you are looking for that planetary uh, life or life on other planets the water parameter is very much important okay now let us move to some other uh, findings from chandrayaan 1 okay this is one lava flow type of feature present on the moon okay so this is actually identified from the chandrayaan 1 image okay so here you can notice that this is that lava tube so this is actually a collapsed lava and here it is buried so here you can notice that the internal structure is a hollow in nature so we in hawaiian uh, islands okay so we have lot of lava tubes like this so what are the advantages of these lava tubes or space application group scientists from ahmedabad they consider these lava tubes as a potential habitable sites on moon okay what is the reason for that one because moon you know that there are no other shielded or shaded regions are there so if you want to go to moon and uh, say think about habitability or you want to conduct some experiments physically or if you want to take a, a rat rapid etc okay so they can go to this particular region and get shielded from the solar flares of uh, this cosmic rays okay because you can notice that here it is hollow and this is a lava tube it is a collapsed lava tube here but this is buried here and inside also it is hollow in nature okay so this is one potential feature on moon scientists consider as a habitable zone on moon so the nasa scientists also have the similar view on this one and they consider this as a potential site so similar examples on mars are like lava caves etc there on mars which scientists consider as a uh, very good site for colonization also okay now this is a, a schematic a sketch of that lava tube you can notice that the impact crater will take place here inside it is hollow and here solid lava is there okay you can enter through this particular region and you can get shielded in this particular region okay so this is a potential site for colonization now coming to chandrayaan 2 so when i am saying about the chandrayaan 2 i know that that immediate thing to your mind is it's a sort of a failed mission because lander has been failed so I would like to mention that lander is only one component of this Chandrayaan-2 mission. Okay, so the uh, Chandrayaan-2 is mainly aimed to have a better understanding on the presence of water, presence of other volatiles, and it also tried for some in-situ studies on that one. Okay, it aimed for the better topography, better compositional studies, search for water on any other uh, volatiles also. Okay, let us see what are the important payloads present in Chandrayaan 1. It has one X-ray software known as CLASS, okay, mainly used for chemical mapping. Then solar X-ray monitor is there, okay, to detect the solar flares. Then one important uh, instrument or payload that is imaging infrared spectrometer, okay, which is having a wide coverage of 0.8 to 5 micrometer. So within this spectral band, or the materials present on moon, either it's a volatile materials like water or what are the solid materials like minerals, rocks, etc., can be analyzed within this particular range. So it is a combination of visible infrared and that thermal spectra is there. That is the imaging infrared spectrometer. Then another one is that dual frequency SAR, synthetic aperture radar. Okay, so it can penetrate towards a little bit deeper of more, like I say, a few meters it can penetrate. We can have some idea about that internal structure. Then we have very good cameras, like a modified version of terrain mapping camera from Chandrayaan 1, then optical high resolution camera from uh, optical high resolution camera, which we can say that this is the finest camera or fine resolution camera available on moon till now. Okay, I'll show the specification later. Then there is change to measure the uh, atmospheric gaseous phases present on the moon. Now let us see some of the uh, important objectives and uh, important results from the Chandrayaan 2 missions. So these results are available in our ISRO websites and uh, you can notice that like uh, when compared to previous images, we are having like a very good images. You see the crater here. It is actually a three-dimensional view of a particular crater. You can see the features very clearly okay so other important features like a geological feature wrinkle ridges indicating of some tectonic activities wheels etc has been identified using chandrayaan 2 mission okay see these are like a finer features of the impact craters can be available through the tmc2 mapping camera and the ohrc 
is the optical high resolution camera it is a spatial resolution of 25 cm from 100 km orbit okay so that is an important aspect it is the uh, specification is 25 cm from the 100 km orbit so you can imagine the quality of uh, photographs or images which we are observed obtaining through our moon using this particular payload okay and it's having a swat of 3 km and this is the highest uh, resolution camera available on mars after nasa cellular on sea mission okay now what are the important results from this ohrc you can notice that very fine particles are present over here okay you can notice here see okay and very smaller minute craters have also been detected using this ohrc okay i'll show you another important image see this is one permanently shadowed crater but see the features present over here see okay so these are actually the boulders present on lunar surface previously we had some indication but this much fine resolution or the features of boulders clearly showing images are not available okay now what are the advantages if you are having that boulder type of features are there boulders can be formed by say some quakes like moon quakes or gravity triggered aspects etc are there or even sometimes it can form through impact crater activities also there so if you are studying these type of features we can have a better understanding on the evolution and the origin of our earth's moon okay so that is the advantage from chandrayaan 2 mission now another important aspect from chandrayaan 2 mission is that like we are having uh, a dual frequency synthetic aperture radar which means that it can penetrate to a few meters of lunar crust and give some very good images so this is actually the nasa's lroc image that is actually the optical image of a pitiscus t crater you can notice that pitiscus t crater feature from our chandrayaan 2 synthetic aperture radar see the features of course that the angle of the viewing angle is different that is why this appears circular and this appears a little bit retreated okay so you can notice like here the features are like minimum but here you can notice that the uh, crater features crater wall internal structure crater floor etc are well preserved and well observed through this uh, dual frequency sar uh, payload okay so important aspect here is that here what is happening like because of that a recolit space weathering aspect some of the features are hidden here so if you can penetrate and take measurements towards the deeper side we will get a better understanding of what are the materials present over here and it will help us to predict the processes in much finer detail like okay you can see this is also from this is uh, the synthetic aperture radar image from chandrayaan 2 and this is the optical image from the nasa okay see so i am not saying that nasa's images are not good because we are having these are the, the uh, images from two different cameras two different instruments okay so this is having its own advantages and disadvantages we are also having advantages and disadvantages are there now let us take one this particular crater crater is up here so it clearly indicates that the impactor was oblique in nature that is why ejector has been focused towards one direction now let us take another example you look at the uh, these two craters okay so this is the crater formed due to vertical impact see the feature over here okay you cannot see that the surrounding ejector blankets or ejector materials over here okay but uh, this one through chandrayaan 2 payload okay so we can notice that surface features clearly then ejector materials also so what are those ejector materials those are actually materials from the surface and deeper part of the planet so if you are measuring those subjects we will have a better idea about the deeper parts and the deeper processes okay operated on any planetary surface so these are the important of course lot of other results are coming these are some of the preliminary results from chandrayaan 2 which is available in our isro website and we are aiming for lot of other interesting scientific results also then when com coming to atmospheric studies also chandrayaan 2 using its chase 2 payload okay so it has measured argon in the lunar exosphere okay so that is also significant finding and from iars like we are eagerly waiting for significant results on water other volatiles present on moon and other minerals present on the moon also so we are actually awaiting the results from these type of missions okay so these are the significant finding from chandrayaan 2 missions yeah. okay so now moving to the chanki mission i am not going to the details but the advantage of that chanki mission is that it is the first mission 
from any space agencies which landed on the highland region and that is also towards the far side region of moon and they also gave very good uh, results on the geology of that particular moon so towards the uh, future mission scientists should look on like uh, these type of aspects then in situ sampling etc also there then this chunky formation has a module okay to test that life related activities on moon okay so they have a simulated capsule okay having some of the seeds of cotton and some other seeds are there and they got some indications you can see this particular video see the cotton seeds it have been sprouted on that simulated lunar capsule okay and it is the first biological matter to be grown on the moon so they got signals for uh, a week seven days and after that there was no signals there but it is a stepping stone towards that life related or astrobiological experiments on our earth's moon okay it has other seeds also fruit fly uh, pupae etc like okay and the signals they got the cotton seeds is sprouting up see laying a foundation for astrobiological studies on moon yeah okay now okay now why we are studying moon like uh, so why it is important so once that the habitability condition of earth or if you are utilizing all the resources of our earth like okay so we have to seek some other regions or other planets or moons okay for habitable environments or for our resources so moon is also having like a very potential resources like uh, the regolith materials are there it is like uh, uh, if you are checking that the uh, regolith you can have a like, lot of other things are there then lot of minerals metals etc are there then volatile components like water ice then carbon then etc are present on moon like okay so this is a summary of that one then another important resource is helium 3 especially towards the mary region okay you can notice that these are the mary region the maximum concentrations of helium 3 they are found in the regolith samples found in this particular mary region okay see so it means that moon is also a resource for helium 3 so if you are developing some technology to extract these minerals okay so we can uh, tap the resources from moon and use it for our purpose also now another important aspects the many scientists are working on that outpost on moon or consider moon as a transit station because lot of water evidences for water has been identified from moon now the scientists have to think about how effectively we can use that water for future missions like that. so a proposal is there from nasa and esa to consider as moon as a precursor for mars related uh, exp experiments or expeditions okay consider moon as a transit region so a lot of water are there okay so we can have fueling from earth up to moon then refueling can take place from moon okay so how that refueling can take place because water ice is there using some chemical reactions we can dissociate that oxygen and hydrogen from water and use the hydrogen fuel for refueling of that rockets okay, okay so that is a concept and uh, many scientists are working on these dimensions also okay so that is one aspect if uh, that on the way to mars okay consider moon as a transit station okay so technology demonstration will take place lot of scientific experiments can be conducted etc can be done okay so these are the advantages now coming to future missions like uh, nasa's artemis mission is coming up that is actually a manned mission okay they have selected one woman and one man okay to go to moon by 2024 okay so it will definitely open a new era for manned exploration especially in this particular decade okay then in situ studies are important uh, isro is also planning for chandrayaan 3 mission okay and uh, so on lot of missions are coming up from various space agencies and uh, recently you might have read uh, that uh, uh uae and uh, china also sent missions to mars like okay now korea is on the way so a lot of space agencies are there okay targeting these planetary bodies for a better understanding of this planetary evolution purpose so now i am uh, coming to the conclusion of this talk i will show you one uh, video showing the what of thing i uh, discussed in this particular lecture okay See, it was a hot molten material at first. Okay, that is at 4.5 billion years ago. It was continuously hit by meteorites, and the anorthosite crust was formed. 
same. Okay, what happened then? It was hit by impactors. Okay, and because of that, Mary regions has been formed on moon. Okay. See, this is the formation of Mary regions. Okay, I'm going uh, quickly. So after that, also the Mary region formation continued from 3.8 billion years up to 1 billion year. Okay, then after that, only like intermediate cratering. And if you are coming to that present scenario, only micrometeorite impactors are taking place on our Earth's moon. Like that. Okay, so what are the future important aspects like a return mission, in situ exploration, diversity of crops, mantle, space weathering processes, then ionospheric or atmospheric studies, looking for any habitable environments like then robotic and human exploration. Okay, so a lot of opportunities are available for youngsters who are interested in planetary science. Don't think that this is only that based on rocks and minerals. Okay, in order to come to this conclusion, we need the concepts from physics, mathematics, chemistry. Uh, etc. Okay, so this is actually a sort of a multidisciplinary science and many missions are there for you by various space missions like Mars, Moon, Venus, Asteroids, etc. are there. I will quickly show you one, two important aspects of Chandrayaan 2. Okay, so this is known as the terrestrial analog research. In Tamil Nadu area in Sitampundi, there are like rocks equivalent to lunar highland rocks are there. Okay, so uh, that particular region is in Sitampundi. Okay, these rocks are known as that anorthosite. So for Chandrayaan 2, you know that a uh, rover and lander was there. So before uh, taking that to moon, scientists should do some sort of test bed experiments in our Earth. Okay, so then only they can send this particular instrument on moon. Yeah. When the ISRO scientists, when they approached that, it was very costly for this lunar material. Okay, then they thought of uh, collecting the materials from India itself. Okay, so they uh, considered the Sitampundi anorthosite as a typical lunar anorthositic material. So they have collected approximately 500 kilogram of material from the uh, Sitampundi area. That is a lunar equivalent uh, rock. That is lunar highland equivalent rock. Okay, so they have actually prepared a lunar yard, which is having same mineralogical physical property, especially in terms of grain size, minerals, etc. Okay, and uh, they have conducted testbed experiments over here. Let's see. Okay, so this is one aspect. That is another important beauty of uh, geology. Okay. Now, in uh, Chalakade region in uh, Chitradurga, okay, so they have artificially created one impact crater. Okay, and also conducted some of these uh, rover and lander experiments over here. Okay, see here. So you can notice one impact crater which is artificially created. They have checked the rover wheel movement over here also. So a lot of scopes are there. Then this is uh, my group, okay? So we uh, usually conduct field work in these type of regions, okay? So this is one region in Muttam in Kanyakumari. Okay, so we consider this as a potential region on Mars, sorry, potential terrestrial analog for Mars, okay? So you can notice that the gullies are there. We know that Mars is a red planet. If you're going to this particular region, it is full of redness, okay? Red sands are there, okay? So along with my students, okay? So we used to conduct uh, field work with the other, uh, universities also okay so these are gully type of features formed on mars sorry formed on Muttam region and these are gully type of features formed on mars like okay so you can have a good comparison over here polygonal cracks in the Muttam region polygonal cracks on martian surface gullies on Muttam region okay gullies on some crater on mars like okay so we can have a sort of comparative planetology using these type of studies also okay so now the last Session. So suppose if uh, any of you are interested in geology or planetary geology, okay, so if you're in your plus two, if you're a combination of PCM or PCB, okay, you can go for BSc geology, then MSc geology, and you can proceed with the MTech in geology, earth system sciences, remote sensing, geoinformatics, etc. A lot of uh, PhD opportunities are also available. Then these are some of the premier institutes in India offering their planetary geoscience courses. Yeah. Okay. So for this particular presentation, many persons have helped me, especially these videos, which I took were from NASA's LROC mission and also from ISRO's Chandrayaan-1 mission, then our director, then uh, other colleagues from IARS and Space Application Center Ahmadwa and my PhD students have helped me for this particular presentation. So thank you very much. Thank you, sir. If you...
So if you can pick up a couple of quick questions because we are running out of time. If you can pick yeah. up some some quick questions and if you can give your email ID to the students, then they can actually write to you. So a lot of uh, questions are there. Like I think. Uh, I don't know from where they Let's start. Like, yeah. yeah. So why the crustal thickness of far side is greater than that of the near side of moon? Okay, very good question. Okay, so I mentioned that uh, uh, it has some role uh, with the Earth Moon relation. Okay, so the there is a tidal force or gravitational pull of our earth towards the moon so that uh, like most of this magma especially iron and magnesium rich magma has been focused towards the mare regions okay and that is also focused towards the near side of the earth like uh, then this magma has been focused towards the near side because of that one that far side less number of uh, maries are there so mare means that uh, uh, iron magnesium regions are there and it got enough thick to grow Okay, so that is the main reason because of that gravitational pull. Uh, okay, what is a procellarum in mode? So procellarum means it is one uh, high. Uh, heat, it is one region, okay, known as the uh, procellarum region on moon, okay. So, uh, it is actually a region in between the highland and the mantle region of our Earth's moon, okay. That particular region has higher components of rare earth elements than thorium, uranium, potassium, and phosphorus bearing regions are there. It is actually formed due to magma fractionation, okay. So, that is also very much important region on our Earth's moon. Yeah, best camera ever sent to moon. Yes, that is the OHRC. Okay, so right now, if you are taking that various uh, cameras available on moon, that OHRC is the best one. That is having a 25 centimeter to that 100 kilometer orbit. Yeah. Okay. yeah uh, there is one question. It's a very good question. Is it possible in the future to create a launch pod in the moon and then use them for future mission? Yes. So a lot of uh, uh, thinking or thought process are going on those dimension also. We can scientists consider moon as an outpost, okay, or moon as a transit station for further uh, exploration. Like that. so, uh, you people can also think about a lot of these things, and you can come up with new new ideas. So, so if you have any idea, you can directly approach uh, uh, Isro. Like that. okay, so if your ideas are good, they will surely contact you back. Because colonization, then utilization of these terrestrial planets, which mentions like a lot of research are going on those dimensions. The problem is that one question is following up continuously. Okay, okay, so yeah. uh, that's fine. Yeah, okay, so uh, I suggest uh, like a student uh, to send the questions to me or even Sargashetra, they can compare and I will try to answer through mail. Okay. So thank you very much for the opportunity. I hope all of you enjoyed our high state program. I use this school's program. Okay. So yes, my only uh, you are requested, students, you are requested to go to Professor Rajesh's uh, you know web page. Uh, that is in IAST uh, IAST uh, website is www.iast.ac.in. And then you can go to Department of Earth and Space Sciences. And in that you can see that Dr. Rajesh's uh, personal page and go there and collect the email ID and then many things that you can see. About uh, you know, many many things, and you please keep in touch with him, and a lot of things that you can learn from him. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Let me connect with the last doubt one child had asked yes. our India's missile man, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, had already foreseen Moon as a future space industrial yes. center. Yeah. 
Yes. So that is one question which one of the child was asking. Yeah. Yes. And we had just celebrated his fifth uh, death anniversary a week yes. before. Yeah. Uh, he made us. He taught us to dream. I should uh, really connect, sir, also very close to Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam to make us the students, the future scientists, to dream the way you are making us to explore moon. Thank you very much, sir. It was Thank awesome. You. Thank you, sir, for that. Now, students, it is actually the farewell ceremony time. Past five days, you were learning the basis of space science from scholars, oh, rank you. holders, scientists, what more could you have expected in this five days time? Now, I, my advice to you is, you must unbox all such opportunities that come your way. Connect yourself with all such programs where you can listen to resourceful people, their experiences. You must have heard Sir Rajesh Sir saying, a lot of homework they all do to present these things before you. So you must not lose any such opportunities. Also do a lot of reading and experiment yourself. That is what we want. You all to be the future scientist. Try to be. Everybody, there is a scientist in everybody. As we say, there is science in everything. Same way, there is a scientist in all of us. So explore it. And now, as I told you, it's time to show our gratitude and respect to all the great people who arranged this platform for us. I, I am expecting no one to leave this platform because this is the time when we have to show our gratitude and respect. There were plenty of people who has worked behind this. So it is the time for our formal valedictory ceremony. I invite our beloved Father Alex Pryculum, CMI, Director of Sargashetra Cultural Center and <coughs> Academy, to inaugurate and welcome the gathering. Yes, good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to the final day of Beyond the Horizon IST at School Program 2020. I hope that this five-day webinar series was really effective for each participant. I would like this time to express my sincere thanks to Professor Vikant Edward, Director IST, Professor Kurimula Joseph, Dean of Student Activities and Welfare IST, uh, and all other resource persons for sharing your valuable knowledge and experience with us. I also extend my thanks to the program coordinators, Dr. Shaijuman C. S. Professor, IAST, Brother Lijin Munir CMI, Assistant Director, Sarkar Chetra, Mrs. Marina, CB Academic Coordinator, Sarkar Chetra, and Ms. Nimi Joseph. You people have worked hard for the smooth running of this program. And more than 1,000 students across the nation have participated in this program. I thank each and every one of you for sharing your valuable time with us. Now I welcome all the IST members, the program coordinators and participants to the final session of this program. I would also like to share with you that happy news that a lot of positive feedback from the participants have been received and so similar programs will be organized in the near future. The details of such program will be shared to your registered phone numbers and so don't forget to save our number. I am really happy to welcome you and all of you to Sardar Chitra family. Once again, welcome you all to the final session of this webinar series. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Father. The valedictorian for the meet is none other than Dr. Kurubila Joseph, PhD, FRSC. 
who is the dean of such student activities and welfare of iist you must have already you all must have already met dr kuruvilla sir in the inaugural address also with contentment i invite dr kuruvilla joseph for the valedictory address sir please good afternoon to all and i'm extremely uh, happy to address the gathering after uh, five days of uh, exploration to space science and technology first of all i wish to express my sincere thanks and gratitude to our director dr vk dadwal and registrar dr yvn krishnamurthy for all sort of support when father alex asked me to organize this joint program and i approached the director he was highly positive very much positive about this because two years back similar program we conducted at changanasheri all the faculty members scientists went there stayed there demonstrated in fact we had a lot of live demonstration including a, a small aircraft uh, demonstration robotics and uh, many many things so it was a wonderful program and uh, the sarkashetra with the able leadership of father alex and his team organized that program such a wonderful manner so when we got this invitation or request from sarkashetra director and under iest management and the concerned faculty members the resource persons they all expressed a positive mindset so all were really glad to accept the request that's why today we successfully uh, completed this five days of iest at school program as i mentioned in my inaugural uh, day address this is our ninth edition of iest at school we started our iest at program by the uh, by by dr apj abdul kalam he was really keen in starting such program because as an, an institute like iist which is the only space institute in asia which is offering undergraduate postgraduate doctoral and postdoctoral program so kalam sir insisted us you should start an iist at school program to disseminate to motivate to ignite the budding scientists towards space science and technology so that's why we started this program with the support and blessings of then isro chairman dr g madhavan nair and then iist director dr b n suresh and all other people so when we started it was a camp at iist four days camp at iist kalam sir used to visit and stay and uh, isro chairman used to stay and interact with the people and it was such a wonderful uh, programs so in their expenses we used to take and later we decided to go out from iist we used to conduct same camp outside iist and we conducted programs in calicut kannur kasaragod changanasheri and all places every year we used to conduct one or two programs uh, this year this is the first program and we are planning to conduct one more program not decided the date and venue so i believe that during this five days of interaction with the space scientist and technologist started with by the talk by none other than the director of iest dr vikeda dwal a well known world renowned space scientist and i believe that it was wonderful a talk 
and I still remember his uh, few slides on a, 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 a photograph from uh, International Space Station as well as uh, the Mars mission took the photo of Moon and uh, uh, Earth. So such a such wonderful. He he is uh, a, a, a one of the best speaker and uh, as I told you, one of the real uh, world class renowned scientist. And followed by Dr. Y. V. N. Krishnamurthy, another great scientist of ISRO. So these two talks really uh, 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 showcased what next for the four days. So over the four plus one day, five days, you have observed various aspects of physics, uh, space science technology through mathematics teaching to physics demonstration, and uh, humanities, uh, Dr. Shaijumon established the applications of space science for the rural people. So all areas of space science and technology we have covered. And uh, lastly, today is uh, Dr. Jinesh and Dr. Rajesh. So wonderful talks, all talks, because in fact, all the speakers we have handpicked with the different areas, so aerospace and all, 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 all area we covered. I believe, strongly believe that this is a very, very rare, unique opportunity. And you are really blessed, lucky to attend such a wonderful program because rarely people will get such a occasion to attend a program a2 is at about space and technology over five days. So I wish to appreciate all faculty members from IAST, the coordinator of this program, Dr. Shaijumam from our side, Srimadi Marina, as well as the deacon, and uh, if I am correct, uh, Miss Nimi, and all team Sarkashetra, all of you did a wonderful job because time management and everything was very, very punctual. And uh, I have a great appreciation on the smooth and successful conduct of this IAST program in association with the Sarvashetra, the team leader, none other than Father Alex Praikulam, my friend. And uh, uh, Acha, you did a wonderful job. You put your signature once again and uh, you have proven that you are a good organizer and uh, uh, we will have more programs in future. And I also uh, thank all the parents and the participating students for uh, attending this program and uh, wish you all the worst. And uh, my dear students, please aim high. You should fix a great goal so that you may please try to become a space scientist and dream to go to moon or Mars or things like that. So here in Trivandrum, you have IAST. Anytime you can come and visit. We will all, after the pandemic, you can come visit, interact with the same scientist. A lot of people are there. You can see the facilities. You can see the laboratory facilities and uh, get motivated. But to this, once again, I wish to thank all participated, supported for this program, all the resource person, the coordinators, and uh, director, registrar, Father Alex Praikulam, and all people. Once again, thank you so much. Best wishes. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Dr. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Shaijumon Sears, Associate Professor of Economics, Department of Humanities. I'm sure you all remember this economist who said there is space for everybody in space. Sir, with delight, I am inviting you to propose the formal vote of thanks. In fact, uh... The Dean of Students Activities already proposed enough word of thanks to all of us. Actually, I am really overwhelmed and humbled the way that uh, Sarga Chandra organized this program. 
see, I can see I was going through the chat box, and right now the students are sending how well received the program. As Dean rightly pointed out, he has handpicked the faculty members from all the seven departments with various expertise, and which actually we aimed it to give diverse nature of space science and technology to the students. You know, in that through that way. We expected that we'll expose these kind of subjects before you. Maybe you would have heard a little bit about this, but you know, uh, last five days you have heard a lot of things about these subjects. And uh, we are very sure that many things that you didn't understood. But the idea is expose these subjects before you. Then you will get to some kind of thinking that you will start thinking about these kind of things. You know, this is the idea. This is actually a purposeful program. We started in 2007 itself in the first year of IAST. Like this was the dream project of our uh, first founding chancellor of uh, uh, APJ Abdul Kalam. He said that you should. He, he, should, he usually he say to us that faculty members you have to learn from students. Definitely, similarly, you have to give to the students. You just present before the students, then you will get to know a lot of the, lot of new things from them also. This is actually a two-way process. This is a very serious thing. We are not taking it as a simple or an easy thing for the students at all. We take it into the utmost spirit and very seriousness. I'm very, very happy that Sargeshetra also took it to that level, even the level that more than that we expected and delivered this into a current form. I am really thankful to you all. I definitely, uh, we already proposed a lot of thanks to our beloved director, because whatever you just take it to him, and then especially like you know this uh, uh, extension activities, he is there. He said that go ahead and do that. There is no problem. Just give to them whatever we learn. Just give to the society. We have many other programs that we have. We are conducting under the under the directions of these student activities. We have many other programs in the society also. So uh, I, I formally thank our beloved director and registrar for giving such a wonderful opportunity. I also thank the dean students. Actually. He was so humbled by saying that, you know, that everything else, everybody else organized this program. But actually, the key person is dean student activities, uh, Professor Kurula Joseph. He is actually the instigator. He is the motivator. So everyone would love to work under him as a team and then deliver it. So everybody like, you know, just grouped together and wanted to deliver. Everybody was fighting for to get into maximum success. That you would have seen that all these lectures, everybody take, everybody took a lot of pain to prepare and came and delivered before. Sometimes it made, you know, it, it actually goes to the level of a postgraduate student in certainly some parts, but the, the other side, it has gone to the level of a, a level of a uh, high school student. So like that, various approaches they are made. So I thank uh, profusely to Dean of Students Activities for giving us this wonderful opportunity and also the association with uh, Sargashetra. I definitely thank uh, Father Alex, uh, the, the, uh, the, uh, the director of Sargashetra Charitable Trust. I, I, I mentioned about this thing in the beginning also in the, in the inaugural time also. So he is so wonderful. And then usually he calls me for organizing such kind of things because Dean is always Busy. So whatever you just say that within seconds it is ready, it is done. He'll say that it is done. Father, it is not a price in front of anyone. It is, it is actually what already. I know that you don't like price and you told that also yesterday. But it is actually a you know a, acknowledgement you are committed for that commitment. Commitment we like. See, you can see that all those faculty we came here for presentation also. They are all very committed. So I wanted to thank them, faculty also for coming and presenting all these. Uh, uh, lectures. I de definitely want to thank uh, uh, Miss Marina. She, she's so wonderful and in controlling the entire program. She's such a very nice person with the pleasing and very, very good attitude. And then she controlled. And you know, everyone, every faculty member, every single faculty member, they are giving us feedback that such a wonderful uh, person that she was actually angering and then controlling the program. So we are very thankful to you, ma'am. For, for controlling the entire program and then uh, doing it in a very, very uh, right way. I also thank the other members of the Sarveshetra team, like uh, the, the, the fa, fa, fa brother, uh, Nigel, I think, uh, Nim, uh, Miss Nimi, and others. So I thank all of them for the support because they are all, I know, behind the scenes, 
lot of work is happening uh, we are see, you are seeing only couple of people like that in iist also many other people also supporting the program i am not only the only the person or the dean is not only the person there are many other people are supporting this program so i thank all of you and from my bottom of heart i wanted to tell you students that you know you just use this opportunity we are not praising ourselves because all of you just heard like you know you never get such combination of lectures these people all people see just like in you know, the last one that you heard the lecture of dr rajesh he is such a important big person in that area. you just go to his website that's why i said to go to his website in the world renowned scientists these are all world renowned scientists so you are hearing combination of such lectures so just get motivated from that and then just go after that we are not saying that you just passionate about space science and technology at least you just instill the scientific spirit in you scientific temperament in you scientific attitude and you try to look the world look look, look around you in terms of in in the, in the mind of a scientist then you can solve many issues even social issues social problems in science scientific issues everything you can solve that is what if you can do if you at least quite few at least 10% of you can do such way we are successful we are happy we are all like honorably doing this thing for 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 everyone we have been doing it for the last 10 years thank you so much uh, sarveshetra team as well as iast team for this wonderful program thank you all and all the very best all very i wish all success you. you can contact us somebody i mean i just wanted to mention one thing somebody keep on mentioning about how we can get admission in iast so one thing is you just go undergraduate program you have to write your iit je advance based on that uh, advanced ranks plus bcm physics chemistry mathematics this uh, two together we make uh, one one uh, we make one index and that is uh, based on that only we are taking so it's a wonderful opportunity it's an easy entry to isro also you just aspire to Uh, to get into iast so this is so you can get all the details from iast web website thank you very much thank you sir for that wonderful word of thanks and uh, marina have... marina one yes, word sir? i forgot yes. uh, your uh, comparing is was wonderful my special appreciation to you i forgot thank you sir wonderful thank you sir. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. Sir. and uh, thank you students i was watching the number the number has not reduced that is the attitude gratitude is the attitude now for the concluding note i would uh, like deacon legend morel the assistant director of sarveshetra to address the gathering thank you ma'am good evening to all prospective professors iast team for the alex program same my that of sarkshetra and the sarkshetra team and all the participants of beyond the horizon as all core things uh, come to an end in life so our webinar titled beyond the horizon also really our great scientists help us to think beyond and awaken our thirst to become a scientist in us through this webinar one spark is enough to explore and expand or i'm sure about through this webinar beyond the horizon uh, this made a spark in our participants hearts as you all know beyond the horizon is a result of the course collaboration with the iist team and the sarveshetra charitable and academic center changnasheri it is my great pleasure uh, to express Uh, sincere thanks to all those who are uh, behind the curtain on behalf of the organizers and uh, deep appreciation for the support and encouragement provided by such great individuals and institutions um, dr shai simon associate professor of iast and coordinator of beyond the horizon already uh, thanked all as well as a statement to all here i would like to express a sincere thanks to dr shai simon sir for your great support and you are in, you enlightened us through a wonderful talk on socio economic impacts of indian space program and i would like to also express a sincere thanks to marina ma'am uh, 
you are absolutely outstanding thank you so much for your very professional example you have showed as a moderator we appreciate our your time and efforts in making this event a grand success you estimated time for each session to make sure door fit uh, to allotted time frame thank you thank you ma'am thank you so much uh, we are getting much better comments from all our participants in both youtube and uh, zoom uh, that shows your aspiration to know more about science and to think beyond our heartfelt thanks to all the participants and students for active participation and your kind feedback Uh, participants please note that all the participants of this uh, webinar will get the participation certificate uh, some of the participants face some difficulty uh, for attending class in zoom and uh, many were attended the classes in uh, youtube uh, we uh, get all the feedbacks from the students through the this uh, youtube and the zoom and also we get the feedback from the whatsapp and uh, uh, mail Uh, participants please note that all the participants of this webinar will get the participation certificates all those who have registered and attended this webinar will get the uh, this part participation certificate those who want the hard copy of your certificate you need to pay rupees 100 uh, through the whatsapp message we will send all the required uh, details to obtain the participation certificate for further details please contact uh, in email our email id is sarkshetra c h r y at gmail dot com i repeat sarkshetra c h r y at gmail dot com once again thanking you all uh, best wishes and i uh, have a nice day with these warm words and kind message we move to end of five days webinar beyond the horizon thank you thank you all hoping to meet you all soon in similar platform good day to all thank you and jai hind thank you thank you all